Look, I just feel like every right video politics. essay content creator on this app the gets up. at least one video where they spiral inward, they interview other creators, they oversight creators, they get one, oh god, oh god, oh god, exercise in sheer futility. And this, this is mine. So, question of the hour, or several. What exactly is the responsibility of the artist? The responsibility to their art, the responsibility to their fans, to the, their participation in the grand plan of human evolution, right? Like, what, what is that responsibility and how do we enforce it? This, of course, leads to other questions like, who is responsible for the byproducts? of an artist's work is social media helping or hurting? Does being so connected make it easier or harder to create actual tangible change in the world? Should celebrities be commenting on global affairs? Should celebrities be commenting on anything? And why in God's name am I making this video? But all of these questions that, that may or may not get answered do kind of come back to the same thing, which is this idea of responsibility and Obviously, we're gonna have to break that one down. <laughs> responsibility definition. The state or fact of being responsible, answerable, or accountable for something within one's power, control, or management. That's a mouthful, but it's fine. It's fine because we do know one other thing about responsibility, right? We do, in fact, have the Uncle Ben principle. With great power comes great responsibility. So, great responsibility is equal to Great power. It's math. We're doing math now. I do math now. So if the power of the art is great and then so if the power of the art is great and the responsibility is great, then the power of X is equal to the responsibility of X. So we just need to solve for X. Math. I am a mathematician and Pythagoras is rolling in his grave. Speaking of Pythagoras, actually, let's get started. Ancient Greece. Part one. Power. Greater than, less than, or equal to. Alternate title, I am not an art historian. We are starting as we often do on this channel in ancient Greece, not because art started in ancient Greece, but because that's where we start philosophizing about it. Or rather, we start to get a lot of philosophizing about things that we will one day call art. Because full disclosure, like art is actually really difficult to define, which is why we're not starting with the definition of art. And it's also not nearly as relevant to this conversation as you would think. Because what art is depends on who you are asking, when you are asking it, and where you are asking it. And also the further back that I went trying to research, the harder it became to tell like art from like we needed a pot in order to, to drink water. So like, we d I do want you to keep in mind going forward that just because we're talking about one type of art in one particular setting, that does not mean that there was no other art happening at the time. That doesn't mean that there was no other art anywhere in the world. It just means that this is, this is the example that we're using. Human history is vast and I am not an art historian. While Oxford Languages says that art is the expression or application of human creative skills and imagination, typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty and emotional power, ancient philosophers were not really that concerned about art as a whole, but rather the specific tangible effects of various forms of creation. Mimesis. Oh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Mostly they are talking about poetry and music because those were generally considered to be the highest forms of art in that time. Lowercase f. And by poetry they mean like spoken and performed poems in place because it is ancient Greece. <laughs> So there's no printing press, there's no mass distribution, and there's no self-published erotica. And even if there were, ancient Greek authors would not be like sitting on TikTok arguing about the logistics of fey orgies. You know what I mean? It's difficult to know exactly how many people could read and write in ancient Greece because it was ancient Greece. They weren't exactly taking a census. But most of the sources that I found estimate that it was between 3 and 10% of the population, which is not a lot of people. So they, they were not writing Ulysses, okay? Well, not that one. Poetry and plays in this time were also not just poetry and plays. They weren't 
simply entertainment or time killers. They were religious activities. Everything in the ancient world revolved around religion. It was very, very important. It's polytheistic. We got lots of gods and goddesses. They're, they're very active in our lives, okay? So we've got a lot of reasons to get together with all of our little fellow meat sacks and chant and sing and dance and cry so that hopefully none of them smite us and our crops will still grow. Um, so they have lots of experiences like that, lots of group experiences, lots of, of this, like lots of, lots of engagement, okay? And these big emotional group experiences have a profound effect on us as humans because we are very lonely. <laughs> We are very lonely little creatures up in our little brains and we can't really connect to other people. Uh, my, my little brain sense of self internal can never really touch your little brain sense of self internal experience thing. So the act of chanting, singing, dancing, and experiencing the same thing as a group of people all at the same time, it excites us and it makes us feel connected, which makes us feel seen and valid and worthy and not like we are pointless flukes of nature cursed with consciousness and cavities. And that phenomena is what Emile Durkheim calls collective effervescence in the elementary forms of the religious life, I think is the book. In these group settings, having these profound emotional and physical and tangible experiences when we're all singing the same thing or we're all watching the same thing and experiencing something together, it helps us communicate our sense of self and our internal experience. And it bonds, it bonds us to the people around us, which is why like all of religion is the way that it is. And also sports fans and musical theater kids and the ancient Greeks. So we're in Athens. Greece circa 487 BC, okay? So Athens is like the place to be in Greece sometimes. And around this time, 487 BC, they start hosting this festival called the Dionysia. Dionysia? Dionysia. In honor of the god Dionysus. The concept of the festival definitely existed before it was in honor of Dionysus, but when they brought it to Athens and made it about Dionysus, it really kicked off. And that's the one we remember. <laughs> Wow, grilly. It starts with like a procession of everybody down to the, the theater. And they're usually holding like a statue or a sculpture of the god. And then they are, you know, there's sacrifices, there's celebration, there's these performances of these dramatic plays, these tragedies for at least three days. And then at the end of it, they do like one really funny one to cleanse the palate, okay? And this is great, right? Like we are watching plays, we are honoring the gods, we are getting drunk with our friends. Who could possibly be mad about this? Plato, 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 Plato was very mad about this. <laughs> and like, hey, I get it, okay? I mean, no one likes an incest storyline, but unless the Oracle of Delphi is out here giving him visions of the carnage musical theater kids will leave in the wake of a suburban friendlies after a vaguely racist production of Oklahoma that will become the bedrock of their personality for the next three years, I just feel like art as here represented by poetry is the greatest danger humanity could face is like a little bit much. Side note, when I was writing that joke, I googled like most popular musicals of the year to try and make it relevant. And look what I found! Which to be fair is further evidence to support Plato's omniscience. A Plato who lived from around 428 BCE to 348 BCE did what any independently wealthy man who could read and write and did not end up dead in a war did, which was become a philosopher. And he's pretty good at it, which is very convenient for us. And in order to understand why, however, we do have to talk about his theory of forms for a minute. Capital F. I promise this does matter, I think. Plato's theory of forms is a metaphysical theory. Metaphysics is just like the like nature of reality, like inception-y stuff. You can think about the forms like a pyramid, and at the bottom you have these particulars, which are all of the, the things that we have in the world now, right? Like all of the things that I can see and touch the actual glass of wine, this actual desk, things that we are experiencing, things that are physical, transient, mutable, and most importantly, contingent and imperfect. Imperfect because 
they are, and contingent because they do not exist all on their lonesome. They are necessarily reliant on something else, which is that next level up of the pyramid, phenomena or lower forms, slightly more conceptual, less specific versions of the particulars. So the particular is this glass of wine, then like wine is the lower form phenomena because there are other types of wine and we can't have this glass of wine if we don't have the concept of wine as it exists in other places, right? And as anybody who's ever been to an electronic music festival will tell you, you can't have the lows, without the highs. So the lower forms do in fact come before the higher forms and higher forms are something like beauty or strength. They are non-physical, non-extended, external, immutable, perfect, and necessary. They have to exist because we know that we have this glass of wine, which means that we have to have the lower form of wine. So there has to be a higher form that the wine is representative of, per Plato. All right, and the, the highest, the highest of all high forms, the best of the best, the reason for everything that exists is the good. And by good, they basically mean good, but like times a thousand, like good, but like on steroids. So everything exists as a representation of that good, and we want to be as close to that good as we possibly can be. Hence, philosophers spending all of their time thinking and writing and reading and drinking. Here is why that's a problem for art. Let's think about a tree, because philosophers fucking love trees. A specific tree is a particular. It is a representation of a lower form of tree, which is the representation of the higher form of beauty, nature, whatever you want to call it, which is all runs its way back up to the good. Now, if I draw you a picture of a tree, this is not a tree. This is my idea of a tree. It's my idea of the particular of a tree, which is the representation of the lower form tree, which is the representation of the higher form and then the good, right? But this, not a tree. So what we are calling art, plays, paintings, poetry, sculptures, whatever, they are imitations of particulars, which means they are taking us one step further away from the good. From Encyclopedia Britannica's Medieval Art Criticism page, Plato writes that works are but imitations thrice removed from the truth and could easily be made without any knowledge of the truth because they are appearances and not realities. I mean, Plato was the guy with the cave, right? Plato was the guy with the cave where all of the people are living in the cave and they only see shadows and they don't know that there's a reality outside of them. They think that the shadows are the reality. That's him. So yeah, of course he sees my shitty drawing of a tree and he's like, oh my God, it's Oedipus II, incest, boogaloo, what are we gonna do? Because he's concerned that if I show someone this wonderful, wonderful drawing of a tree, they may very well convince themselves that this is what trees look like. They may have never seen a tree before, who knows? And they could be convinced that this is a real reality of a tree, that this is a particular. And in that sense, it's not just their understanding of trees that's one step further away from their good, it's the whole experience of reality is taking them one step farther away from the good. And sure, maybe my tree is a bad example, but if I were to ask you, what did Caesar say when all of his friends were stabbing him? You'd probably say et tu brut, when actually that's just some shit Shakespeare made up. He probably said something more along the lines of ah! And don't get me wrong, it's a great play. It's a fantastic play. It's a very sad play. It's an epic play. It's, well, I mean, one might even call it a tragedy. Look, I know that none of you watched my succession video. I get it. I'm sorry. If you did, then you will already know way more about tragedy than you need to know. So I'm not going to go into it again. Aristotle has taken up enough of hit my screen time on this channel, but I will give you a little recap because Aristotle was Plato's student. So Aristotle did kind of inherit this, inherit? Yeah, this idea that theater is imitation. Only like, he didn't really think it was a big deal. <laughs> like, he was like, yeah, no, uh, that's, I mean, humans imitate, that's like kind of our thing. Like that's kind of what we do. He thought it was great. He thought we should be mimicking and recreating actions on stage because he thought that if we were all collectively watching terrible things happen to other people, we could expel these emotions of pity and fear in a moment of catharsis. Enjoying plays and poetry was about expanding our knowledge and our minds and, and honing our judgment skills. 
As long as they're good though, none of that shit poetry. Anyway, the two big ideas that we have here are art as imitation as number one, and also this idea of art as emotional regulation, which Plato did also kind of touch on. Plato was a big fan of music and he did think that music, though very dangerous because anybody who's been to an electronic music festival knows that music can make you feel things. He did also think that intense strict training in music can help you learn to control it and use it to temper your emotions and your kind of unrestrained feelings. Speaking of music, I have an EP coming out <laughs> on this date. I'll put it on the screen. It's called Gamora and this is just a plug for it. Anyway, point is that all over the ancient world, we have this understanding of what we would now call art as being powerful and dangerous and able to, you know, control our emotions and our thoughts. And that's why Plato was so concerned about it because it wasn't just one thing that happened to one person one time. It was a tool that could be used and abused by anyone in power to control and affect the feelings and thoughts of the masses. And it most certainly was. <laughs> Part two, God and other drugs. So like Plato was not the only one who was concerned about the dangers of art as imitation, right? So were the Christians. So concerned in fact that they put it in the 10 commandments. It's literally the second one. The story goes, if you don't know, that Moses is like vibing on a mountain, getting in touch with God, and boom, stone plates with 10 very explicit rules for humanity to follow for the rest of time. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. <laughs> Same. Punishing children for the iniquity of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Exodus 20 lines 2 through 17, that is the New Revised Standard Version. Now, we know that the Bible was written by man, right? But we don't know with any degree of absolute certainty which man. We do, however, know that it most certainly was not written in English. So here are a couple other translations of the second commandment to give you a taste of what we're dealing with. What I do find so funny about the second commandment though is that God clearly doesn't think that anyone is going to listen to him. Like he starts with like, do not make any art of me or heaven. But if you do, I'd rather you do it in the house at least be cool about it. Um, anyway, depending on the specific flavor of Christianity that you are sipping on, this can mean don't get too stoked about pictures of hot Jesus, or it can mean no pictures of Jesus, hot or otherwise. Because nobody wants you worshiping like the painting of God or like the vase with the, the painting of God on it. Nobody wants you worshiping images of God and Jesus and not actual God and Jesus, which is like a beautiful sentiment, right? If you are reminding yourself that you you are created by God and focusing on like your internal connection to the divine. And it's also a great means of justification for pillaging communities and confiscating all of their religious paraphernalia in order to replace it with your own. So iconoclasms, because this is so common that there's a name for it called an iconoclasm, iconoclasi, iconoclasmicism. Iconoclasms are basically mass destruction of like religious art. Usually this is done to replace that with your own as a way of like forcing the community that you are colonizing or pillaging or taking over in whatever way you want to call it to practice your own religion and not whatever religion they were. But sometimes it is also to just get rid of it all together as like a statement. Put a pin in that. Meanwhile, iconoclasms, again, Christians, early Christians loved an iconoclasm, which is fine. It's fine if you are, you know, Christianity conquering and pillaging a bunch of these like pagan communities. You can just get rid of all this like other art that's not real and doesn't have any cultural value at all, obviously, and make everybody Christian and then God will love you more, right? So it's, it's great for them. But the problem is that if you do this right, like if you do iconoclasms well, which the Christians did, then you end up in this situation where you just have like 
65,000 different versions of Christianity and like everybody's Christian, but you're still like taking over and conquering, you're suddenly confiscating and destroying like pictures of Jesus and like Mary. And like, that's maybe not the best way to honor thy father. You know what I mean? There's like two major iconoclasms during the Byzantine Empire in like the 8th and 9th centuries where all of these holy figures that they are destroying are like holy figures of Jesus and Mary. But at the same time, like iconoclasming is a great way to force people to practice your religion. So like, uh, what are you going to do? Invoke the second commandment. You are going to invoke the second commandment. No religious imagery at all. Or more commonly, very specific kinds of religious imagery per my decision. My being like the colonizer. Are they colonizers, ruler, Christianity? I'm being intentionally vague here. We're being intentionally vague this whole section because the Middle Ages is long, okay? It's long and it's vast. So when I say like the church, that could mean anything from like the Vatican to like the head of a local church in a small community, right? Like whoever is making the decisions in whatever given community, the church, okay? It changes depending on where and when we're talking. So this is not a blanket statement of how everything happened all the time, constantly from exactly one CE to exactly 1300. It's all very loosey-goosey, I'm not an art historian. Point is that iconoclasms start to become like a big problem, right? Because the church is like, dude, we are having a holy crusade. We are off to spread our message and none of these bitches can read. It's just like ancient Greece, like literacy in like Europe in the Middle Ages is not exactly through the roof, okay? And why should it be? Like why, if it's 605 and you work on a farm, you don't need to read. Like you don't, you don't need to read. You especially don't need to read a language that you don't speak either. That the church is not exactly gung-ho about teaching you to speak either. The, the church is very particular about Latin and Greek and the like original holy languages that the Bible was written in in these times. Like all of sermons and masses are given in these languages. So if nobody can read and nobody can speak the language, you have to teach them the Bible somehow. They're not giving sermons in the native tongue of the people they're colonizing. Evangelism is not a game of charades. There needs to be a system in place. And if the church is good at anything, it is putting a system in place. <laughs> so they basically are like, hey, we're gonna need a book with pictures. And it's a long book. It's a long, it's a long book. There's a lot to get through. So the church becomes heavily, heavily invested in patronage of art and consistently demands very specific things from their artists. They wanted works that not only conveyed the stories of the Bible accurately per their opinion, but work that was like transcendental. They wanted paintings that didn't just tell you what happened in the Garden of Eden. They wanted paintings that gave you the warm and fuzzies. This extended to music that could be sung in groups that was easy to learn and pleasing to the Lord and your ear, right? My God is an awesome God is a banger. My God is an awesome God he raised from heaven above and I don't know the rest of the words, but even like evangelical churches still do this today. Uh, these big like non-denominational <laughs> mega churches, they pour a lot of money and time into these worship bands that re release honestly some some sick ass music, <laughs> some uh, some absolute bops, not only to draw people in, but to make the people that are already there feel like they are experiencing the Holy Spirit. The medieval churches though, they don't have concert halls, they don't have neon lights. Hi. They have big churches and cathedrals that they treat as art as well and are commissioned and designed specifically to bring like the maximum religiosity, right? Like the, mo ah. the most godly, the most gorgeous, the most fantastic places, okay. Are you settled? They don't have late stage capitalism yet. They are making do with what they can. But at the same time, 500 CE to 1300 CE is a long time and it wasn't exactly King Pope, you know? So in addition to recognizing the necessity for art that worked to, you know, indoctrinate, I mean, educate the masses, they also needed to keep whoever was on whatever throne in whatever given place and time happy so that they don't, you know, go off and translate the Bible into English or start a new religion so they can divorce their wives. 
Gothic art and architecture is a good example because it's very religious and spiritual and, you know, designed for the same purposes as everything else, but it's also very representative of the 12th century, right, new men who were really into commercial enterprises and government and bureaucracy and urban planning. And, and they loved it because it was so sort of intricate and specialized and made them feel like they were using their big brains, right? It made them feel included, okay? So what we see here is the church recognizing and perfecting the use of many forms of art, right? Not only to educate and communicate a message, but also to maintain a stronghold on the population, to control the narrative, as well as regulate the public through these imitative arts and the controlled emotional experiences that they were curating. And they were so good at this, in fact, that most of the art that we find from the Middle Ages in, you know, medieval Europe is Christian religious art. And it all flows very nicely in theme. There are movements and moments, but everything sort of evolves and works together in this very controlled, calculated manner, which again is a tactic that the church still uses today. Children's Bible book, church plays, worship music. But none of it has the same like joie de vivre. You know what I mean? It just doesn't hit the way that it once did, right? Because right after the Middle Ages, we get the Renaissance and the Renaissance is well, it's the Renaissance. Everything is more fun now. Everything is more fun in the Renaissance, right? The plague is over. Technology is advancing. We can print multiple copies of things. We can also use oil paints now so we can work on a painting over long periods of time and also like use more colors. More people can read. More people can read. The Bible even gets translated into English at one point, which is a whole hullabaloo for another day. But in general, the need for religious art that the church had has gone down, right? Now, don't get me wrong, people were definitely still getting their shawsibles in a twist over exactly how figures like Jesus and Mary should be portrayed. Michelangelo's The Last Judgment caused a bit of a ruckus in the Counter-Reformation Catholic Church because main mans did not gasp, have a beard, hearsay. I mean, also he was surrounded by like 300 naked men, but you know, I'm sure that had nothing to do with it. Also, the church still had like a really decent market share, economically speaking. But it's the Renaissance. In general, more people, different people, were interested and able to patron artists and have art commissioned. And they are not popes. They want different things out of their art. There's a big neoclassical movement, a big classical revival. People want paintings of the Greek myths and people are reading ancient Greek philosophers like Protagoras, who was all like, man is the measure of all things. So they start to think like, hey, like maybe being human is like, not the worst and maybe like we could be happy or like maybe I should be king. Royalty and the wealthy used art and portraiture to paint things as they wish them to be. Kings who were old and smelly and had dead wives were painting themselves young and hot with their resurrected wives by their sides. Well, they weren't painting themselves. They were paying people to paint them, but you know what I mean? Because it's all still very intentional, very purposeful. It is painted with the desire to communicate specific things. And the emphasis is on the person person receiving the art, not the person making the art. Oh, speaking of, and this is a little weird, right? Because today art is all about expression. And while, you know, the wealthy could commission anything that they wanted, they're probably like not commissioning da Vinci to paint his greatest fears for them to hang in their hall. You know what I mean? And if we're here to talk about me, <laughs> the responsibility of the artist, then we should probably talk a little bit more about the artist. Not Da Vinci though. We're gonna talk about Jacopo Tintoretto. This is St. George and the Dragon, painted by Jacopo Tintoretto around 1555 or 1558-ish. It is a painting of the event of the Christian legend where St. George defeats a dragon. St. George and the Dragon. It's very pretty self-explanatory. It is a really common Christian motif. Technically, this legend kind of exists long before Christianity got a hold of it and turned George into a saint, but that's neither here nor there. This specific painting of it, though, was commissioned by a very devout religious clientele and was intended to be more or less a recreation or imitation of Carpaccio's St. George and the Dragon from 50 years earlier. Evidently, 
that is not what happened. Since we're talking about beautiful art, Carpaccio's St. George and the Dragon, we see George. He is decked out in soldier gear, totally destroying the dragon, right? Like he is nailing that fucking dragon. Then we look at Tintoretti's and we see this lady, this guy, the Loch Ness Monster, perhaps? What happened? Well, for that, for that we need to go to 20th century France. Which is probably a good time to put the cinepot out oh, oh, there. There we go. Jean-Paul Sartre. Sorry for pronouncing it. 20th century French existentialist philosopher, famous for that no exit play where like hell is other people. So Sartre actually writes a, it's a really in-depth and interesting analysis in this book. Between existentialism and Marxism. And we are gonna bring this up a bunch later, but I wanted to start with it here because he basically breaks down a lot of the differences in these two paintings. So I'm gonna like summarize some of the key differences that he notes. I just, I'm not an art historian or critic, so this is not my analysis, but I do find it very interesting. Jacopo begins by relegating the soldier and the animal to the half light of the middle ground. This is a favorite procedure of his. As a rule, he makes use of it to rob us of our time. Not so in this case. After all, what believer would not ardently seek out a Christ or Virgin Mary in the depths of a crowd? Yet however great may have been St. George's contribution to the welfare of Venice, the most serene city has loftier protectors, among others, St. Mark. No one will take the trouble to peer into the half-light to discern the shabby and indistinct scuffle there. St. George isn't popular enough. If a painter wants to impose him, let him bring him close up, out in the light. This is what Carpaccio did, and this is what Robuste refuses to do. Robuste is uh, also Tintoretti's name. It's confusing, don't worry about it. This George is the painter's personal enemy, the protagonist of every drama, the adventurer who is called in treatises on morality, the agent. Tintoretto's brush will exile this captain who disturbs the universe of pathos by the incongruity of an act. Carpaccio was an aristocrat and his work reflects that. His soldier is front and center, proudly defeating this creature. He's in beautiful profile, gripping his lance, which is the pointy stick thing, with his whole hand and sitting up straight and proud and like jamming it into this dragon, right? Then we look at someone like Jacopo Tintoretto who kept his very working class name. Right, when a lot of artists were changing their names for them to be like more high class and fancy. Right? He kept his working class name and we don't know much about his early life, but he was one of like 20 siblings. And we know that even though he became wildly successful because he could paint very, very quickly, we'll get to that, he always maintained relationships with and, you know, did cheaper commissions for the poor churches that were his first patrons when he was starting out. So even as like a Venetian superstar of an artist, he was very much like a champion of, of the working man or we can assume, so Sartre thinks. Sartre also talks about the differences in George's attire in uh, Tintoretto's painting, where as the armor in Carpaccio's is, you know, full and robust and, you know, gleaming, George in Tintoretto's is uh, like half armor. He's not wearing big fancy boots. He's got like regular working dude shoes on. And he's also actively sort of using the downward motion of the hill to destroy this dragon. We don't see his hand on the lance, but he, we know that he has it and he's utilizing everything at his disposal and he's not paying attention to where we, the viewer, are. In a word, for Tintoretto, George is a workman driving in a nail. I wanna read one more passage from this. There's a lot of big words, just hang on. It's unnecessarily pretentious, I will translate, but it is really pretty, right? So. In reality, the still medieval servility of the artisan masked an uneasy liberalism whose origins lay in economic competition and a morose egalitarianism born of his social intercourse with the bourgeoisie. He's saying that Tintoretto was critical of the people that he was making paintings for, and he was kind of consciously or unconsciously sliding these perspectives and these views into the work that he was creating, right? He's putting the woman who is outrunning the danger and the woman who is kind of falling victim to this whole situation in front and center. He's putting the city, the beautiful, proud city that's being saved way off in the background. He is sort of actively telling us things that the commissioners probably didn't ask him to tell us. It's not that artists were like deliberately putting sneaky secret rebellion 
ugliest messages into all of their commissions, although some of them certainly were, but rather the perspective and life experience of an artist shining through the bourgeoisie requirements. There's a reason that it was so hard for the churches to find the right artists and why they heavily patroned specific artists when they found one that they liked and could communicate what they wanted, because there is something else going on when we are commissioning art or making art. Why do you think so many people wanted paintings of the same scene, right? If just painting the scene was the same no matter who did it, we wouldn't need several thousand. Even though it is imitation, there is also something that is inherently unique being generated at the same time. And Plotinus, 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 ancient Roman philosopher. I know we don't usually go to Rome, but technically speaking, he was born in Rome and Egypt, lived in Rome a little bit and wrote in Greek. So do with that what you will. He super picked up on this, okay? And he is like the founder of Neoplatonism. Neo, new Platonism, Plato, doesn't matter. He took a lot of Plato's works and revived them and readjusted them for, you know, his modern era. And one of those ideas that he revived from Plato was this idea of art being imitation and kind of dangerous, but like, not really. He's like, look, like Phidias made a statue of Zeus that one time. And like, none of us know what that dude looks like. So why, what is going on there? What happened there? He surmises that like Phidias must have been employing something else in order to create that statue. There had to be something else going on besides just pure imitation in order to create not an exact replica of what Zeus looks like, but instead a representation of the idea of Zeus that came directly from Phidias's mind. Watch it be Phidias. He writes in um, Aeneid, the arts do not simply imitate what they see, but they run back up the forming principles from which nature derives. While he recognizes that like, yes, painting or sculpting is imitative, he also thinks that there is an element of this recreation process that allows you to divinely connect to that divine form of good, right? Remember Plato's forms? Like he thinks that you can kind of run it back up. If this sounds very Christian, you are correct. The early Christians loved Neoplatonism. They get so hype on Neoplatonism. But anyone who has ever made art can probably attest to a meditative sort of emotional cathartic experience. There are these sort of intangible effervescent uh, moments that are non-repeatable and often do feel like a religious experience. Anyway. What's so interesting about art from this time is the way that artists express that and express their perspectives and their imagination and, you know, unique ideas within the strict boundaries or requirements of the ruling class. Because the ruling class, you know, whoever they were, knows and, and has known for centuries exactly what kind of power art has over the individual. And they were not keen to let that cat out of the bag. So whether it was the church or the monarchy, whoever it was wanted to keep art under control, which of course is not at all what's happening today, right? Part three, bourgeois, see you later. <laughs> So um, one of the many TikToks that I have saved for this video as, you know, kind of things that inspired me to make it revolved around the recently announced Taylor Swift album, The Tortured Poets Department. And it expressed some concerns about Taylor Swift reusing the Taylor Swift handwriting as a font and sort of manufacturing authenticity. There's a lot of logos. It has a lot of branding and different versions of the album containing one additional song, like just concerns about the sort of capitalistic nature of the the Taylor Swift empire that we are living in. And well, hello, many of those are valid concerns. There are valid, valid concerns. But what caught my eye the most about this wasn't even necessarily their kind of concerns over the way that it's being handled. It was their assumption that because of all of this, the album is not going to be as good. It's no longer art. It is just products for people to consume 
to purchase to fuel the capitalist economy. And as a result, the quality is gonna suffer. That's exactly like what we saw with the MCU and what I fear is coming with the MCUification of Taylor Swift's brand. Right, they're saying like that's branding, that's not artistry. They don't have faith that the music of this album is going to live up to anything in the past because it is so heavily, heavily focused on branding and marketing. This level of capitalism is not sustainable, I think is what it said. And this is not the first or only time that we have, you know, come across these grievances out in the big bad world that we live in. Martin Scorsese famously called Marvel movies not cinema. Francis Ford Coppola went as far as to say they're despicable. People have been comparing book talk to fast fashion, right? saying they're kind of churning out bad books just to make a profit. There's concerns about, you know, TV having terrible writing because they're just trying to get out as many TV shows as possible and bad music on and on and on and on. And I don't disagree with this, but it does sort of come from this assumption or belief that art can exist without capitalism in the first place. This idea that there can be art for art's sake. This idea of art as true expression I find really interesting and so it's something that I kind of asked a lot of the people that I was interviewing about and what they felt like the role of expression was in art if there is pure expression. Often what when art is most impactful is when it is someone reaching into themselves and trying to articulate something that they are feeling meaningfully and trying to put that out into the world in a way that expresses what they're feeling in a emotional way. Because, you know, it, it, it's trying to hit at people in, in a way that like, you know, seeing information, um, just reading cold information might not actually influence them. Because, you know, they, there's always that facts don't care about your feelings crowd, but mm. your feelings do care about facts and how we feel about facts and the way facts are presented. Um, I think influences a lot about how humans interact with them. And so I think like it, it, a person uh, art is just try someone trying to express earnestly what, how they feel about the world and put it out to others to experience. But then also you could talk about, and it kind of stems from that is that art can also be about trying to put out how a person or a group feels about the world uh, in a way that like tries to get other people to agree. It's why you see things and, and this is like gets into the realm of propaganda and I use propaganda not in a yeah. way that says like it's it's an inter inherently negative thing because all art to some degree is propaganda. But in terms of like it's why we get to see like so many things like being like you know the hero's journey is like the individualists who can take over like who can bring back and save society and they're like yeah. these emblematic people of our world. Whereas, you know, you can look at other art that's just like trying to showcase more different political values like anarchism or things like that and like showcase that through through art. Now bear with me because this section is going to get a little, it's going to get a little wonky. It's going to get a little wibbly wobbly in the timeline. Just hang on tight. You'll get through it. Unfortunately, capitalism is not a straight line. It is more of a very complicated Rube Goldberg machine. So settle in. You'll be fine. I believe in you. Let's talk about King Louis XIV. King Louis XIV, okay, mid to late 1600s, loved art, okay? The man was really, really into building beautiful, beautiful buildings and commissioning beautiful, beautiful paintings and portraits. He had like 20 statues of himself made, none of which included that one time that he got smallpox, but many of which did include him doing various things like being a Roman emperor or being the god Apollo or being Alexander the Great. So do with that what you will. He commissioned artwork, he commissioned tapestries and buildings, all of which were down to the very, very last detail designed specifically to reinforce the majesty of the king and the importance of the monarchy and the aristocracy. It was to keep everything in line. He founded the Royal Academy of Dance. He founded the French Royal Academy of Fine Arts in 1648, just so him and his pals could have like complete control over what was being taught to the youths and produced in the country as far as art is concerned. King Louis XIV dies in 1715 after being king for forever. And he takes his boring Baroque art style with him and suddenly everyone is like, oh my God we can do 
whatever we want. We can paint swirly C's and S's. So then we get this like Rococo style that's very sort of free and extravagant and free and extravagant. I just wrote that twice. And the thing about this Rococo style is that it's always sort of described and seen as like frivolous, right? They use words like indulgent, excessive. Even before 1789, popular taste had begun to turn away from the disarming, lighthearted subjects of Rococo. As revolution neared, artists increasingly sought noble themes of public virtue and personal sacrifice from the history of ancient Greece or Rome. They painted with restraint and discipline, using the austere clarity of the neoclassical style to stamp their subjects with certitude and moral truth. So we're going to talk about Marxism for a second. Don't worry. Don't panic. It's going to be fine. It's not as complicated as you think. It's much worse. But we don't need to go into all of that detail, so you'll be fine. But I want to quote the Marxist theory of art history, socioeconomic determinism, and the dialectical process by Thomas Renro, because he writes... When there is a new economic base with a new class in power, new types of art develop on it as a superstructure instead of evolving directly out of previous styles. What does any of that mean? Superstructure. Superstructure is everything that is not directly to do with production. Right. So we're talking art, family, culture, religion, ideology, philosophy, law, media, politics, science, education. And the superstructure, so all of those things, are shaped and maintained by the base, which includes all of those Marxist buzzwords and the things that are directly related to production, right? We're talking mode and beans of production, tools, machines, factories, land, raw materials, human labor, private property, capital, commodities, and the social classes. The social classes are, we have the proletariat, that is us, and then the bourgeoisie, which are the sort of ruling class. If you want to make that more complicated, you totally can, but we don't need to. So the base maintains and shapes the superstructure, right? The superstructure also maintains and shapes the base, like binary stars or Tom and Jerry, they, they, they affect each other. So when we look at like the shift from Baroque to Rococo, you can sort of see the evolution and freedom that comes with like, you know, a new art style developing, but it, it makes a lot of sense. It's not a sharp left turn. You can see how they flow into each other the same way you can see the sort of through line in a lot of the medieval Christian art. The shift from Rococo to neoclassical around and after the French Revolution, however, is much starker and reflects the sort of sharp change in the economic base. So instead of building on or evolving from, we are reacting too, because it's not just the the mindset and the ideology of the ruling class that's changing like it was when, you know, the church changed hands or we shift from one king to another. It is a full shift and overhaul of who is economically in charge. So via the revolution, Louis XVI is thrown in jail, monarchy abolished, no more cake for Marie, and the royal collection of art becomes national property. What do they do with this collection of art? This glorified propaganda, remnants of the regime that they just overthrew. What do they do with it? Do they burn it like literally everyone else has ever done when they take over as a top group of people? No. Uh, No, they gather it all up and they put it on display in the Louvre and people can go see it for free three days a week. They give it back to the people. So now it is owned by everyone. And while this does like take away its political power, it does not take away its value. It reassigns it. This art now has a value outside of its original intent and context. This art has value even if it was done in favor of someone we hate. It has this new other kind of value, aesthetic value. Because it's pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty. And as art has over the centuries been pulled farther and farther away from a religious tool or a monarchical political tool, it starts to become a matter of taste and status. 
your ability to know what art was good and what art was bad and how much art you had seen, whether you were trained in dancing and writing and piano as a child, like all of these things were measures of status. So it makes a lot of sense then that this is when the idea of aesthetics as we know it today starts to emerge. Coined by Alex Baumgarten in Germany in 1734, aesthetics reduces taste and judgment of art to a purely intellectual act. There is a right and a wrong and a way to find out that right and wrong. And thus, the seeds of art for art's sake are sown. And aesthetics is born. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that deals with beauty and the nature of beauty and how and why we find certain things beautiful. And even though we can, you know, definitely attribute and describe the work of certain philosophers before 1734 as aesthetics, right, as a study or a theory of aesthetics, because of how closely beauty was sort of connected to the idea of the good or religion or the monarchy or whatever, it really doesn't get its own pony ride until the 1700s. And it's sort of unfortunate, however, that the moment that beauty is sort of freed from the confines of these other philosophical concepts, it is like immediately shackled to capitalism. But we'll get there. First, we got to talk about Kant. <laughs> Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant is an 18th century philosopher and he was the dude who was like actually I think there are moral truths and I think that we should all be good all the time and never lie to anyone ever and his whole thing about aesthetics and beauty was that like beauty was sort of inherently valuable that it was purposeful all on its own. The beauty and pleasure that sort of arose in a person from experiencing something that was beautiful is in itself the reason for it existing. So for Kant, the best way to form an aesthetic judgment was not just to not consider the context of the art that we are judging, but to actively ignore it. <laughs> like, for example, a piece that is hanging in a museum next to hundreds of other pieces with specific lighting and little blurbs and linoleum floors and flash cameras. Did you know a lot of people consider museums the place where art goes to die? I found that out when I was making this video. Some people call museums cemeteries. I mean, I call them black markets because of the British Museum, but still. Not to mention all the money laundering. So this idea of t stripping the art of its context is how Kant says you can make like a perfect aesthetic judgment. And Walter Benjamin is like, no, 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 no. To be fair, Walter Benjamin is operating with significantly more context. Context. Walter Benjamin is writing about this in a post-camera world. The same way that like oil painting and technology changed the way that art was made in the medieval time period, the industrialization of the 19th century has a profound impact on art and art distribution. Allowing poets to roast each other publicly is not the only blessing that the Industrial Revolution gave us. We also get the phonograph, the first recording sound machine, and on top of all of this, the most important, impactful, biggest change of all time, depending on who you ask, dun dun da. The camera. The camera is invented. And oh, oh boy, oh boy. Marxists and anyone who is even vaguely capitalism wary was very, very concerned about the camera. And they definitely had a right to be. The camera, first invented in 1816, I think, by the time it garnered widespread use, basically had introduced commodification into the art world because it removes the art from its original context. If you can take a photo of a work of art, you no longer longer have to be there for it. So the artwork has this sort of free-floating experience removed from the fixation of time and space. So the artwork loses its aura when it is detached from the socio-cultural place. 
And this is what Walter Benjamin discusses in his 1935 essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. Modern technology separated art from the higher, almost religious area occupied by the classical works of visual and musical arts, works that had a distinct aura or sense of authenticity. And this is really interesting because even Sartre writes that when he is in London, where the St. George and the Dragon painting is hanging in the National Gallery, or at least it was when he was alive, he, like, takes everybody to go see it. Anybody who he's there with, like, he always goes to see this painting. And he loves that painting, <laughs> even though it's hanging in a museum light years away from its original context, which technically also didn't really have anything to do with Tintoretto at all in the first place. It was just a commission because he was asked to communicate a specific idea and his internal little self just like bled through because that's how it works. So... So on the one hand, art is more accessible. It's more practical. We can all we can all enjoy it. More people can make art. More people can buy art. More people can commission art. It's not necessarily wasteful to be like writing poems and novels in your free time or to even believe that you could one day have these things published and sold. Novels that were personal expressions, right? Personal stories and subtweets at your ex who also happens to be everyone else's ex. But on the other hand, that art can be reproduced bought and sold and taken out of its context. So not only are you able to take the art out of its context, right, like moving the Mona Lisa into a museum where it can be photographed, but when you are photographing that Mona Lisa and you post it online, all of the people who are seeing that photo are even further removed from the original context. Kant, of course, does not give a shit about any of this. Of course, Kant says none of this matters. <laughs> Knowing what we know about Tintoretto's life should not impact our ability to judge the painting's aesthetic value. Beauty and aesthetic value drawn from a piece of work are experiential only. Aesthetic judgment, the way that Kant wants us to be doing it, the art is no longer being valued for its collective meaning and for the aura that it's produced. It's being sort of judged and valued based sort of solely on how much people like it in a world where you say how much you like something by buying it. Social conditions can release and inspire creativity or the opposite. What Marx was concerned about is like stuff you see in, in I think we talked about it in that Star Wars video I did, but like the Society of the Spectacle that I think, um, I think yeah. Mark Fisher wrote. Um, a little Church. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and, and basically just this discussion of how art especially in a capitalist society, will end up trying to just remove the message in order to just reproduce it in order to like remove context from it and just sell it back to you. And so when you look at like something like Star Wars Andor, it's a big brand, it's sold by Disney. And so like it's this very revolutionary work that ultimately is being used to uphold the status quo. Mm -hmm. And they'll send and Disney will sell toys with Andor's face on it and things like that. Though it is noticeable that like Andor doesn't sell as well. <laughs> it's like it's a show that yeah. doesn't really do well. It didn't it was nominated at the Emmys but it didn't win any because often mm -hmm. like uh, works that like push back against the status quo will, will rarely earn prizes from it but some of them can't ignore it because of how yeah. popular it is but you look at something like Squid Games which is a very popular show um, that was very anti-capitalist um, then being taken by Netflix to make Squid Games the challenge which is just reproducing the Squid Games and making the show the viewpoint of that show is the viewpoint of the aristocracy in Squid Games, laughing at people uh, like fighting for their lives. And then the Squid Games, the challenge just uncritically makes that and makes us, the viewers, the aristocracy, looking at people making like fighting for their lives. Um, and yeah. so that's what capitalism does. It strips context by constantly moving things. And you see that with like the franchises that we see. Like I love Star Trek. I love Star Wars. But like as those franchises have gone along, they become more less and less meaningful as works of art because they're just being stripped to just be aesthetics. And then as we talked about aesthetics, reproduce produce the status quo often. If lowercase p politics is the discussion of how power is distributed, then the stuff that we make is going to be innately political because in our society, power is distributed a certain way. You're making a, a, a cooking video on YouTube about how you make this recipe. Baked into that is going, baked into that, is uh, going to be certain assumptions about what ingredients are normal what foods are are normal to have where you and your your culture come from um and 
uh, can it be kind of miserable to have to live in, in a constant political soup? Yes, but I think it's more irresponsible than not to just kind of ignore that. We can't predict exactly how socioeconomic structures, class divides, and lifestyles are going to impact what art is made and how, but we cannot completely discount the impact of those things either, right? Marx and Engels in the German ideology write, the production of ideas, of conceptions, of consciousness is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men, the language of real life, conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux, which just means like flowing out of, of their material behavior. Speaking of the intercourse of men, Oscar Wilde, we're going to talk about him a bit more in the ethics section because there will be an ethics section, but since we are talking about aesthetics and the 1800s, we kind of got to bring him up because that was sort of like his whole deal. Oscar Wilde was the poster boy for the aestheticist aesthetic, I think it's aestheticist, movement. They called themselves Estes. And they were also dandies, which I love and just means exactly what you think it means. And so their whole thing was sort of echoing like what Kant said, that the purpose of art was just to be beautiful, to create pleasure and the utility of one's actions should be to create the maximal amount of beauty and pleasure in one's life and nothing more. Art for these guys should not hold any moral or educational motivation, and that such motivations actually, in fact, make art worse. And this applies to both judging art and creating it. The aesthetic doctrine essentially held that the art need not have any moral, political, religious, or educational purpose, that only when art is for art's sake can it be immortal, therefore can it be true art. The picture of Dorian Gray, famously, all art is quite useless, which he kind of ripped off, but that's a story for another section. We talk about Dorian Gray a lot in my succession video, if you're interested, but here we're focusing on this idea of like art being useless for a moment because like while there is something vaguely radical about declaring that all art is and should be completely useless in the middle of the sort of industrialization and ramp up to capitalism where everything is being assigned its value based on productivity and what it can do and how much it can make and how fast. I don't really think that's what they were going for, strictly speaking, because that is kind of like an insane thing to say, right? <laughs> that is an insane thing to say that all art is useless, true art is completely pointless, because if it's true, then like, what have we been doing for 2000 years? <laughs> Part four. I'm your biggest fan. I'll follow you until you love me. Propa propaganda. So in late spring of 1937, the Republican, which in this context actually means like communist, socialist, anarchist side of the Spanish Civil War commissioned Pablo Picasso to create a work that would bring attention to the war effort and aid funds. This is that piece. Guernica, how do you pronounce that? Guernica. Guernica, cool. It's called Guernica, and if you are American, you may also recognize it, even though you don't know the history of it, because it became a very important symbol in the United States in opposition to the Vietnam War. So the original is in the National Museum in Spain, and a tapestry version that was commissioned in 1950 by, by Nelson Rockefeller was has been on loan in the United Nations since 1984. So this painting, this tapestry, this piece of work that had to be covered up in 2003 when the United Nations was talking about the war in Iraq. This is not something Oscar Wilde would consider art. We seem to have today in the 2020s have gotten really hung up on this idea that art now has become nothing but a tool for the bourgeoisie and that capitalism is ruining what used to be true, pure, non-politically or non-economically motivated expression. But I'm not so sure that that's true in either direction. Again, it depends on the function. I think video essays would be different, but I feel like what you're talking about with art is trying to figure out how best to get people to come away with the message that you want them to understand. So I think like Star Wars and or just using it as an example is like, it's very much coming, trying to get people who maybe don't understand like Marxist philosophy or whatever, or um, anti-fascist movements to come away with like, yeah, I get, I want to understand it without necessarily like knowing the words for all the philosophy. Um, yeah. 
Whereas like if you have some movies where they like stop and give like a a like lecture in the middle of it, it can put people off. Setting aside the like our video essays art question, because again, what qualifies as art really is not as important as we thought it would be for this conversation. When I made, say, the Snape Wives video, I made that because I wanted people to stop making fun of the Snape Wives. I wanted to vindicate them. I wanted to explain them. I wanted people to understand. That video had a function. It's literally called Understanding Snape Wives. And aestheticists might argue that, you know, per their standards, the mere existence of a functional aspect disqualifies that video from being art in the first place. But most of my work here has a function of some kind to educate someone on something, even if that someone is myself. And even my music has a function to feel something, to experience catharsis when they have heard what I have made in the same way that the churches carefully design every single corner of the chapel to perfectly reflect maximum holiness, I sat with myself and my lyrics and later my producer who more or less was someone I commissioned to help me and we crafted every single bass line, every single sound, every single drum hit with the express goal of serving a specific lyric and a specific emotional outcome in the listener. This is aesthetic functionalism. So aesthetic functionalism is a theory that argues that all art is not simply a reflection of society, but it has a purpose in society. And there's no set number of possible functions, but here are some examples. A psychological benefit. Psychological benefit is what I just talked about. It's what we talked about with Aristotle and catharsis, pleasure of tragedy, grief, joy, awe, etc. things like that. And it's not just that we feel these things, it's that feeling these things benefits us in the long run. Two, educational purposes. And not just video essays where I'm quite literally telling you things, but songs about the states and capitals, paintings of other cities and people that you might not otherwise see, right? In a pre-camera, pre-internet world, perhaps. Christian church pageants, old school morality plays, fables that teach a moral, cautionary tales, and stories of people doing the capital R, capital T, right thing. Three, social critique. Things like satire, allegories, where you find yourself holding a mirror up to society. Realism, as it is used for self-reflection. Star Wars. And the big one, political purpose. Political parties of all kinds have used art as a way of gathering people to their cause. And in this sense, political doesn't just mean governments and political parties as we understand them today, but goes all the way back to, you know, monarchies, regimes, and again, the church when they were like top dog. It explicitly using art not only to educate, but for explicitly political control. And while there's a lot of overlap, political purpose differs from just like an educational purpose in the sense that it is explicitly attempting to persuade, right? Which is why in 1622, Pope Gregory the 15th founded the Sacred Congregation for Propagation of the Faith, a little secret team put together to plan and organize and arrange missionary work and propagation of the faith. It's a good name. It's a good name for what it does. And this is what popularized the idea of propaganda as we know it today. The word itself comes from the Latin neuter plural gerundive, whatever that means, form of uh, propagare, meaning to spread or to propagate. So then propaganda means the things which are to be propagated. And it was like a fairly neutral term until like the 20th century. It was just like spreading ideas. It was just like a thing, like it wasn't, it wasn't quite the devil's work. But after the 20th century, propaganda has garnered a new reputation. And now, according to Google via Oxford languages, propaganda is information, especially of a biased or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. So nowadays, propaganda is always evil. <laughs> Pretty much always considered like evil and manipulative and wrong and full of lies and, but like, but at the same time, not all propaganda is created equal. Sure, sometimes it's Nazi children's books and Radio Free Asia, but other times it's it's more subtle and, dare I say, artistic. God's not dead, he's surely alive. He's the God's Not Dead movies are propaganda for Christians. I promise this whole video is not just gonna be like greatest hits of all my other videos, but this is a, a deep internal breakdown. We're having, we're spiraling inward, so. The God's Not Dead movies are propaganda for Christians. They reinforce the worldview that the American education system in, and the secular world is 
out to get you. And all of the best Christians are the ones that fight the oppressors and rack up those saved souls. But they are also movies. Like they are still movies. They are movies and like Sabrina the Teenage Witch like is an actress, right? She's an actress. She's not like in the CIA that we know of. My point is that the people who made these movies really believe this stuff, right? Like she's a Christian, she she agreed to do that. The people who make police procedural shows like Law and Order and CSI, like they aren't sitting in a bedroom taking notes from the Republican National Convention leader dude on how to portray the system properly. They just believe that stuff about the justice system, about the police force, about law and order. Uh, Skip Intro has a really great series of videos about the portrayal of police in different television shows. And the Law and Order one I highly recommend because law and order is propaganda. So it's Try That in a Small Town, which is a song that I will not play because of copyright and also ethics. Try That in a Small Town was a controversial song released by Jason Aldean. And it is all about how like city folk shouldn't try robbing and, and bringing their, their big bad crime into the small towns because they also have guns. It was called out for definitely like implied racism for sure. Like it's very much a weird contradictory song that starts starts with being like, I dare you to pull a gun on a liquor store owner. And then the next verse is like, I got a gun that my granddaddy gave me and I'm going to shoot you if you try and shoot me. So it's very strange. Um, gross. It's a, it's a rough song and it was very controversial. Not with any of the people who like Jason Aldean though. They didn't care at all. Because apart from the fact that he's a country artist and definitely pandering to a very specific audience in order to sell more t-shirts, he, or at least the people who listen to his music, do actually believe that there is a difference between the gun that your grandfather gave you and a gun being used by someone else. <laughs> they really believe that their small towns are better at protecting themselves than cities are. They really believe that people are the problem. These kind of works, these are what Brett Silverstein would call integration propaganda. Integration propaganda is promulgated, which just means put into effect, not in pamphlets put out by small groups of subversives or in broadcasts made by foreign powers, but by the main channels of communication, newspapers, televisions, movies, textbooks, political speeches, etc., produced by some of the most influential, powerful, and respected people in society. Thomas Monroe writes, highly educated societies demand intellectual, moral, and aesthetic means of strengthening the regime. So often creative minds are drawn into the service of the current regime without realizing it. And there is no better example of this than abstract expressionism. So abstract expressionism was a movement that surfaced in the aftermath of World War II and the Great Depression. And after all of that sort of realism, propaganda, do it for your country, they were all just like, absolutely the fuck not. Like, fuck the rules. I am over this Uncle Sam bullshit. Vibes only. So we start to get a lot of art that looks like this. <laughs> Abstract expressionism aimed to be apolitical, to separate politics from art. We are doing art for art's sake. People really did not like this movement. In 1957, Robert Wamthmuy can't pronounce that, sorry. Uh, a white painter who focused on painting mostly black people in the rural South, he gave a whole speech about how the art for art's sake and abstract expressionist movements and language were absolutely absurd and ruining everything. <laughs> I don't know much else about this Robert Guamthi guy, so I'm not recommending you like go worship the ground that he walks on, but parts of that speech are kind of relevant to what we're talking about, which is that he argues that the very idea of art for art's sake is working to separate art from its birthright. Like to even pretend to separate subject from artistic intention is to infringe upon the expressionist's basic structure, to deny its anatomy. Art is the sheer realization of the anatomy of the configuration of a visual whole. It is the conceptual solution of complicated forms, the perceptual fusion of personality, not humble ornamentation of surface pyrotechnics. Beauty never comes from decorative effects, but from a structural coherence. Art never grows out of the persuasion of polished eclecticism or the inviting momentum of the bandwagon. Yeah, he was like, real heated. He did not like this movement. He did not. He did not like the idea of this at all. But 
they were committed. They, the expressionists were committed to just vibing and embracing spontaneity and creativity, rebels without a cause. So intentionally, they were not being political or educational or even emotional. It was purely like expressive and creating beauty and art and feeling like in the moment or whatever. They were, for the most part, um, a bunch of white dudes from cities. And, you know, that's a that's a very specific worldview that is shaped by the socioeconomic conditions of the time that bleed through and doesn't exactly want to disparage the status quo. After all, I mean, they are totally free to make that art and nobody is trying to stop them. Claude Xernouchi writes that under the banner of art for art's sake, modernism sought art's independence from political manipulation. Art could be political to be sure, but artists were no longer willing to subordinate their own concerns to those of the powerful. Which is why it's so funny that abstract expressionism was funded by the CIA. Yeah, so abstract expressionism was completely funded by the CIA. Uh, <laughs> And this is absolutely true. This is all true that I'm about to tell you. You can look it up. It's in the CIA's like official declassified documents and whatnot. Technically speaking, the artists didn't know. They weren't aware that they were being funded by the CIA because technically speaking, like technically speaking, they weren't. They were on what the CIA calls a long leash policy. So they were being funded by people who were being funded by the CIA, right? Like... <laughs> So their patrons weren't necessarily CIA, but they definitely knew people who were CIA and they worked very hard to keep this a secret from them and also to work with museums, with MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, and art collectors and galleries to put on exhibitions around the world and inflate the price and the value of these abstract expressionist works to get it out into the world as part of a propaganda war on communism. Hey guys, look, look at all the freedom that capitalism allows. We don't have to paint boring, realistic bridges like, like they do over in that communist dictatorship hellhole that we're telling everyone the USSR is. We can splatter all the paint we want. I am not saying that abstract expressionist art is bad, but I am saying that if you have ever found yourself being like, how and why do people love and think this weird abstract paint splattery art is valuable and worth zillions of dollars, I don't get it, you are correct to feel that way. You are right. Nobody really, like, I'm not saying nobody liked it. I'm not saying it's bad. But you are very much right to, to feel that way. It was deliberately artificially inflated because of the message, because of the message that it was sending and how that benefited the United States and the CIA in this insane Cold War propaganda nonsense that was going on. To quote an article from The Art World, the absurd fallacy of art for art's sake resides in this, that its adepts deny that art is a language organized by mankind of the past for communication, thought, and emotion. At first, merely decorative, symbolic thought, then religious, then ethical, then social thought, but always thought, ideas and sentiments capable of shaping the life of those acted upon. And like, if we really want to push this to the breaking point, which we always do here, <laughs> the idea of doing art for art's sake is in itself like a political ideology, right? It's a reaction to economic structures. Like the abstract expressionists were saying they wanted a political art, but that in itself is a political statement. So then like, like who is this for? <laughs> who is this, who is this art for art's sake business actually benefiting because it didn't start with the expressionists, right? It started long before that. The phrase art for art's sake is the English version of l'art pour l'art, l'art pour l'art, a French slogan that expresses the philosophy that true art is utterly independent of any and all social values and utilitarian function, be that didactic, moral, or political. Utilitarian is the like ethical idea that you should be trying to like make the most like net good outcome in the world. 
and it comes from the 1835 novel Mademoiselle de Maupin by Théophile Gautier. Technically speaking, according to the art story, the Swiss writer Benjamin Constant used the phrase art for art's sake in diary entries found from about 1804, and also the French philosopher Victor Cousin, who used it in published lectures in 1817 to 1818. But it was the like 1835 use of the idea that really kicked off this whole movement. And the passage is this, nothing is beautiful, but that which cannot be made use of. Everything that is useful is ugly, for it is the expression of some need, and the needs of man are vile and disgusting, like his poor, weak nature. The most useful part of the house is the privy. Remember when I said that Oscar Wilde kind of ripped off that like all art is quite useless thing? <laughs> is what I was talking about. All Art is Quite Useless is in like the prologue of Dorian Gray or the preface. And this statement is also in the preface of this book. This book, Mademoiselle de Maupin, is not about art. <laughs> this book is about a man who falls in love with a man and convinces himself that this man must in fact be a woman dressed as a man because he is in love with him. Yeah, doesn't sound like there is anything going on there, buddy. Just pure form and form only. No expression here, no, no usefulness, nothing to see here. Just a regular old little story. So keep that in your brain. While I tell you a little bit more about the aestheticists who really, you know, got really into this movement. They were generally quite elitist. I mentioned that a lot of them were dandies, which meant exactly what you thought it means. It was just people who loved like the finer things in life. They were very concerned about their appearance and their social standing. What I'm saying is that the aestheticists were not like jumping at the chance to break down class barriers and let everyone live however they really want and achieve happiness in like communal action. The picture of Dorian Gray is kind of famously about this man who loses himself to hedonism and pleasure and kind of goes down this like dark path to like ruin, basically. Arnold Berliant writes in Artists and Morality Toward an Ethics of Art, most art depicts the artist world, shapes its sensory dimensions, and portrays its people, events, feelings, confusions, and ideals. In doing so, it illuminates the wider social world of human beings, and by sharing that vision and shaping the aesthetic awareness of others, acquires a profoundly moral stature. And like, looking at the art that survived and flourished and thrived during that time period, during the decadent, you know, aesthetic art for art's sake origins. It's not about nothing. <laughs> I had a whole bit about how Dorian Gray wasn't about nothing. So at the end of the day, when you're looking at it, it seems like the aesthetes and the decadents who, you know, birthed this movement, they seem to be less concerned about creating art that was not politically or morally motivated and more concerned about not judging art for its political, moral, and ideological messages, which are two very different things. Because remember, both of those statements about art being useless are in the preface. They're not in the text. That's debatable for Dorian Gray. But it, to be fair, this was really common. A lot of books and novels and writings from the 19th century uh, have like just a preface that's just like, my thoughts. <laughs> it's not really, it's not usually relevant at all. Like it's just them. They just, they just have a chat. Um, it's like this. <laughs> But they are two different things. Judging art and creating art are different things. So this begs the question, like, why, oh, why would a bunch of artistic, alternative, independently wealthy, sad boy artists with flowers pinned to their lapels be so concerned about the way that their homoerotic self-insert fan fictions were being judged? I'm not going to tell you that every 19th century aestheticist was only spouting aestheticism so that they could justify being horny on Maine, but I am going to tell you that a lot of 19th century aestheticists were just spouting off aestheticism so that they could be horny on Maine. They wanted to separate and clearly distinguish between the moral status of the art itself and the moral status of the artist making it, because you can't put a book on trial. If you are on board with art for art's sake and aestheticism, then 
there is no connection between the art and the artist who made it. So, you know, art for the esthetes was not meant to persuade or influence. It was just meant to be beautiful. So all of those homoerotic letters that Oscar Wilde was writing to young boys, they weren't grooming, they were art. I'm not a groomer, I'm just a loser. And I'm not making that up. That is a legitimate argument that that the man used at his trial. <laughs> the trial of Oscar Wilde for homosexuality is not what you think it is. So if you're like, this, like, what are you? <laughs> that was a legitimate argument that he used in his trial when they read off these letters. He was like, I'm a writer. <laughs> And they were like, it's a letter. A trial, by the way, that he would not have been on had he not tried to sue someone for calling him a sodomite in the first place. But I digress. I don't want to draw any more, you know, threads between homosexuality and the legal system and morality. But bigoted laws and sort of biblical conceptions of morality aside, if nothing else convinces you that aestheticism was just for the obnoxious gays who liked playing with fire, the whole thing falls apart the minute that Oscar Wilde gets convicted. <laughs> aestheticism comes to like an abrupt end. Everyone's like, oh damn, well, it didn't work. <sighs> Art for art's sake, over. At least for them, you know, not so much, not so much for us, right? Because art for art's sake carries on and we will all one day have to reckon with separating the art from the artist and the art from the artist from capitalism and all sellouts and meaninglessness and Marvel movies and Taylor Swift and JK Rowling and the nightmare that we live in today. Don't worry, we are not doing like separating the art from the artist, death of the author. That dead horse has been revived and beaten and its ghost has been trapped in a bottle. Like we're, we're leaving it, we're letting it lie. We are gonna talk about some other stuff though, which means it is time for part five, the ethics section. So we're on page 22 of 47, and we've talked about the power and influence of art for a while. So it's probably a good time for us to shift onto the other side of the equation. Remember the math? We're doing math. Remember that? <laughs> Remember that bit that I started this with? It's fine if you don't. Let's go to the other side. Let's talk about responsibility. And to do that, we're going to have to talk about Lolita. I say have to, we don't have to, nobody has a gun to my head telling me to talk about Lolita, but this is your trigger warning for that. We are not gonna be reading anything from Lolita. We are not going to be describing in detail the scenes or you know, even really talking about the movies. Um, but if you're not familiar, Lolita is about child sexual abuse. That is the kind of overall theme of it. So we are going to be talking about that throughout this section. Also, just because this is the ethics section, we're going to be talking about morally reprehensible things in general. That said, we are also going to be talking about other books and movies and pieces of, you know, work and art that contain other morally questionable behavior or other things that other people deem morally questionable. But I need to be very clear that this is not a comparison of the level of badness of the thing, okay? If we are talking about Lolita being inappropriate and say, Catcher in the Rye being like inappropriate and two banned books, we're not saying that those are the same thing, okay? We are going to be talking about things that generally everyone agrees are morally reprehensible and some things that only certain specific groups of people consider to be morally reprehensible. So please bear that in mind. Please be mature and understand that everyone has a different opinion on what is and is not morally acceptable. Whenever we are in the ethics section, we have to talk about norms and we have to remember that everything is kind of relative. Even if you don't believe that it's relative, if you're not an ethical relativist, fine for you, but like the way that the world works is very relative. So bear that in mind. Anytime that we are summarizing or if any, or talking about something that I think might be a little bit uncomfortable, I'll put like a little, I'll put like a a, a, a siren or something or like a thing an x on the screen so you can just mute it if you want um or you're welcome to skip this section none of this matters anyway <laughs> let's talk about lolita lolita is a 1955 novel written by russian-american author vladimir nabokov which is an anagram for vivian darkbloom 
who is a character in the book, fun fact. So Lolita is a novel that follows a professor who idolizes a 12-year-old girl in his head and manipulates his way into her life so that he can begin what he considers to be a sexual relationship with her. We know that you cannot have a sexual relationship with a child. That's not how it works. Uh, this is abuse, but really want to dive into the novel itself. This is a really great video about, you know, how to adapt it and why it's so difficult to adapt. Or you can read it. It's an uncomfortable read. It's graphic. It is written from this man's perspective, but it is also, it is also a very good book. It is, it is a very good book. It's, it's, Generally, when we are discussing the ethics of a piece of art, we have several different axes that we are sort of circling and talking about. We have the morality of the art object itself. So the morality of the book Lolita, the content within it. And we have the morality of its existence in the world. The fact that we have this book to read. The fact that it's published and put in the hands of, of people. And the morality of the artist behind it. That's Nabokov. Like the morality of the person who made the thing that has the thing in it. Okay. So if we look at Lolita, the content is very disturbing. It's inappropriate. Even in the 1950s, it was still illegal. Definitely immoral wrong behavior going on. Paintings of violence, films of abuse and violence, music about abuse and violence, all of these things that are happening within the context and the story of the art are wrong. That's actually not that complicated. If we look at photojournalism, particularly sort of gruesome war zone photos and any sort of photograph of a horrific event or infamous, you know, footage of 9-11 or something like that, it's very easy to look at what's going on in the photo and say, that's wrong. That's bad. That's a, that's a not great thing. Most people who love true crime and eat fictional crime novels are going to tell you that murder is wrong. So we can judge the morality of an art object using whatever moral system or code or behavior we personally want to follow. But because we are not here to decide objective moral standards, we're going to leave it at that. That's kind of all we need to say on the morality of the art object. It's not complicated to say that the content and the actions taken by Humbert Humbert in Lolita are wrong. But it is really complicated to try and figure out that second axis of, but is it wrong that it exists? So we're going to table photojournalism and true crime and documentaries and things that are very much real. We're going to table those for a minute because Lolita is not real. The story, though it is kind of said to have been inspired by certain real world events, doesn't matter. The story is not real. Like Lo Lolita is not a real person. And this changes things, right? It has to, because while anyone can say that the material content of something like Lolita is immoral and wrong, does that necessarily mean that the book shouldn't exist? Obviously, the Estites and Oscar and co would say that the only thing that matters is if it is good or not. But reducing the morality of something to its quality is kind of a slippery slope because quality is a matter of taste. But we have to sort of look at the existence of an art object, regardless of its material, and find a way to judge it. And a sort of easy way to do this is to use consequentialism. Earlier we mentioned utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a form of consequentialism. Consequentialism is where the rightness or wrongness of an act is measured based only on its consequences. Utilitarianism specifically says that we should strive for actions that have a net good at the end. I don't think they use the word net good, but like we should be striving for the best overall outcome for the most amount of people. The invention and enforcement of the use of seatbelts is a really good example, actually, because even though, yes, they do harm people sometimes and they do cause problems in accidents, overall, Net good. Net good for, like, saving people's lives, right? Generally positive. The invention of Oxycontin, however, not so much. It, it helps some people, but overall, net bad. Net bad. But those are both products with literal physical effects as well as social effects. The invention of the seatbelt, people telling you to buckle up to think more about safety in general, 
is a physical, actual impact. The invention of Oxycontin had technological and medical advancements, the literal health effects of literal people, not to mention the opioid epidemic. Like these are physical, real world, tangible impacts that are significantly easier to measure than the social effects. The social effects of something like seatbelts, I guess, would be people being annoyed by them, people feeling morally superior about them, like seatbelts. So we can be safe. I don't really know how people feel about seatbelts. I think it's mostly neutral. But again, like Oxycontin changed what we think addiction looks like. It changed how much we trust doctors and pharmacists. It changed how we view medication and medicating ourselves and how we think about pain. Arnold Berliant notes, unlike the products of commerce whose specific purposes and uses may also have wider social effects and whose broader effects must qualify their more immediate benefits, the products of artists do not only have general social effects, in most cases, they consist wholly of those effects. No children were harmed in the writing of Lolita, just like nobody was actually murdered in order to make Clue. The only effect that these things can have is the ideological social impact that we have been talking about for however long this video has been going, which is where the idea of responsibility really comes into play because the question is where does the line get drawn? Is Nabokov responsible for just the book or the films as well? Is he responsible for the red heart-shaped sunglasses and lollipop outbreak or Lana Del Rey? <laughs> is Ayn Rand responsible for all of the shitty men who like Atlas Shrugged? Is Nietzsche responsible for how into his shit the Nazis got after his sister like reworked all of his work and gave it to them because she was a Nazi after his death? Like it's really hard to draw a line anywhere down the chain of impact from art to individuals action because our actions are sort of dictated by ideology and the world that we live in. Even if we wanted to draw the line at say like another person's choices are their choices, are they? Nabokov seems to think that he holds some responsibility for the fact that nobody names their kids Lolita anymore. Now, there are forms of consequentialism that take intention into account, right? So they take into account whether or not you intended for your book to stop children from being named Lolita ever again, or whether or not you intended for your art to incite an angry mob. If you didn't want that to happen, then it's not really your fault. If you didn't intend for anyone to see your painting of a murder scene and want to read create it, it's not your fault. But that's actually, that's actually not a very popular version of consequentialism. You can qualify it and say like what you intended and reasonably expected the outcome to be. But at the end of the day, this is still very much not a popular version of consequentialism for people who are consequentialists. Because at the same time, if you get behind a wheel drunk and you kill someone, even if you didn't mean to kill someone, you are still held responsible. That was a reckless choice and somebody died for it. So if you know that the material of your work is harmful in itself or has the potential to be harmful, does that mean that you shouldn't make it? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. Nobody knows. You can't know whether or not you're going to die and your sister is going to become a Nazi. You can't know whether or not your work is going to be severely misrepresented and misunderstood. So even though consequentialism is a helpful tool in assessing moral responsibility and or the rightness or wrongness of an action after the fact, it doesn't actually help us navigate the decision making behind creating the art in the first place. That is something that artists have to navigate blind. So there has to be another way of measuring or deciding whether or not we think a piece of art should be made. Which brings us to number three, which is the morality of the artist. Brilliant notes that the morality of the artist is before all else the morality of a person. Which, sure, but like, I mean, not all persons morality is created equal. If the artist doesn't give a shit and like wants to do harm, then it's a no brainer, right? Do whatever you want. Like if you don't care if you're hurting people, then like be my guest. But if you don't want to hurt people and you have art that has the potential to do that, only you don't know exactly to what extent it has the potential to do that. Like, what do you do? Like, what do you, 
Well, for one thing, it's not real, right? Your art is not real. We've we've still tabled and shelved the photojournalism, real documentary stuff for now. We'll get to it. But for the most part, it's not real. So maybe you get a pass, right? Like we, we as like the moral community, which is people who are deciding the morals of things, we give people passes for violating moral and ethical codes all the time. <laughs> We allow soldiers to kill people all the time. In fact, we encourage it. Doctors don't go to jail if somebody dies on their table, even though they were holding the sharp and pointy object. I'm not saying that those actions are the same, but their exemption is the same, either legally or sort of socially. These people get distinct rules because they are performing distinct roles in society. They are doing things that have a specialized skill. They are doing things that not everybody has to do every single day. And Berlian acknowledges that artists do perform a distinctive social role, possess powers of their own, and produce work that by virtue of its uniqueness stands apart from the contributions of others. If you are an artist who is lucky enough to be sort of well-known and have your art viewed by millions, you are clearly doing something that is unique and special. Is it better or worse? Who knows? But it is distinct. So maybe they do deserve a sort of specialized, distinct judgment. I mean, maybe that's what Ariana Grande thought was going to happen when she released Yes And, which is a song that flaunts what many people have deemed to be immoral behavior. Maybe she thought that she would have more grace and more wiggle room. By virtue of being a successful and talented singer, maybe she felt that she would be bestowed by the public more moral ambiguity. Uh, but... No, no, that doesn't happen to be the case. That doesn't appear to be the case. Not where TikTok is concerned. Hi, Mau Mau. As far as, you know, the internet and TikTok was concerned that I saw, she was held morally responsible for that song. I'm not... Blah. But Biz, that's a song about real people. I thought we tabled everything about real people. We did. Let's, let's, let's bring it back out. Let's, let's, let's pull it down from the shelf, right? And let's talk about photojournalism. Again, cannot stress enough how much we are not comparing the moral badness or goodness of actions to each other when we are having this discussion. We are comparing the ways in which we as a moral community judge the people making certain things. Even though Ariana Grande did not get a lot of moral grace and was held morally responsible, that's not really the case with photojournalism. Photojournalists and journalists in general are not held morally responsible for capturing images and writing about horrific, horrific actions around the world. Or are they? The 1985 World Press Photo Award went to French photographer Frank Fournier for capturing the image of a 13-year-old Omira Sanchez who was trapped under the debris of her home after a landslide. She died shortly after this photo was taken. The 1994 Pulitzer Prize was awarded to South African photojournalist Kevin Carter for capturing the image of a child crawling on the ground while a vulture waits in the desert in Sudan. It is called The Vulture and the Little Girl. While neither of these photographers were held legally responsible for the deaths or harm of their subjects, Kevin Carter specifically was never able to shake the responsibility and he cited the photos that he took that in Sudan in his final note before he took his own life four months after winning the Pulitzer Prize. There was also an infamous New York Post photo where a photographer happened to have his camera out and captured the moment that a man had fallen into the subway tracks and uh, was, you know, hit by a train. And there was a lot of controversy surrounding why the photographer was taking a picture instead of helping. The photographer said they're too far away. I believe them if that's what they say. We're not holding people responsible for other people's deaths. But the questions around, should you have taken this picture? Are you exploiting this person? Should the New York Post have posted it? Are they exploiting this person? It's kind of easy to look at something like the, the New York City, New York Post subway incident and say like, yes, that is exploitation because people do get hit by trains on the subway a lot. Uh, I lived in New York for years and it does happen. And they are, you know, real people who, who have families that are going to read the New York Post. It's easy to make the argument that that's exploitation and that you shouldn't be doing that because it's harmful. It's less easy to make that argument about photos like the vulture and the little girl that are showing people in other parts of the world what is really happening, right? Photos that are 
being sort of sent back to the West and are informing Westerners of the things that they should be doing to help people, right? Photos of what's going on in Gaza right now are important and helpful, but are they also exploitative? You get into the conversation of like, is it worth it? Are they doing more good or not? And I don't, I don't think that there is a correct answer to that at all. I debated even putting it in this video because I feel like it is such a different conversation to be having. Um, but since we're talking about all different kinds of art, journalism and photojournalism are art. And so I wanted to kind of bring it up at least a little bit. Additionally, you know, along those lines, you have the sort of true crime documentaries and the true crime sort of fictionalized, like the People versus OJ and the Jeffrey Dahmer TV shows and movies where now you are creating something fictional out of something real that really happened. And that I think is a conversation to be had with the people that the story is about, you know, I think moral relativism, right? Like, I don't believe in objective moral truths. And I think that it really does come down to whether or not the subject of the art is able to knowingly consent to being kind of made into a work of art in that way. But that doesn't help us solve the Lolita problem, does it? Told you this was gonna be a heavy section. That does not help us solve the Lolita problem because Lolita is not real, Lolita is fictional. And while Nabokov states that there is no moral to Lolita, it was not intended to say anything particular about the content. It is also hugely inspirational and influential on culture. Lana Del Rey. <laughs> Most people haven't read Lolita, but they know what Lolita's about. The idea of the nymphette and the ideas expressed in Lolita breed victim blaming and justification for abuse like nothing else. Whether or not that was Nabokov's intention, neither here nor there, you can scream unreliable narrator at the top of your lungs all you want. It doesn't change the fact that if we want to talk about functionalism again, right, there are people for whom that book w has a psychological impact, right? I, it, you know, it made me very uncomfortable. It did the thing. And there are other people for whom it's going to have, you know, an educational impact. And that, and that doesn't even begin to tackle the fact that while we can all agree that everything in Lolita is inappropriate and wrong and morally reprehensible. Lolita is not the only book that is considered controversial and morally wrong. List of banned books. Of Mice and Men, To Kill a Mockingbird, Catcher in the Rye, 1984, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, Gender Queer, A Memoir, Animal Farm, Beloved, Captain Underpants. <laughs> Skip that one. We're going to consider that an outlier. Lord of the Flies, Fahrenheit 451, Go Ask Alice, Lolita, and there it is, Looking for Alaska. This is the main reason that I keep saying that we're not comparing the badness of things because I really want to talk about Looking for Alaska in this section, but I do not want anybody <laughs> misconstruing what we're talking about. So just like one more time to be super clear, we are talking about the reasons that people want books banned, the reasons that people say books are immoral, the way that we judge the morality of the book and the artist and its existence in the world. Looking for Alaska is a young adult novel by YouTube darling and America's sweetheart, John Green. And it often finds itself on banned book lists with Lolita. Why? Why is it on these lists? Well, if you haven't read it, the novel is about teenagers at a boarding school. It is coming of age, teenage mental health, and dare I say Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I'm sorry. I it's a beautiful book. It's so good. I love Looking for Alaska. I remember reading it. I was a sophomore in high school. I remember getting halfway through that book and just gasping and crying in class. <laughs> like We were watching a movie. I think we were watching Rent, the a, like filmed stage version which looking back is actually I should unpack why we were doing that uh, anyway I it's it's a it's a gorgeous book and it is so lovely so why is it on these banned book lists why is it being compared to Lolita well uh there is a scene there's a scene in this book where two teenagers get to like second base 
one time. And now poor John Green has to go around all the time and explain to people why that's not porn, which is absurd, right? That's an ins- that's insane. But it it's a thing. It's a thing that he has to do and has had to do since the book came out before he was even famous. And then once The Fault in Our Stars kind of took off, all of his other books got more attention and it just kind of threw it back into the spotlight. I think that a teacher was like questioned by police or almost arrested over recommending it one time to to middle schoolers or high schoolers. I don't remember. Um, it's not marketed for children, though, for the record. It's not it's not a book that is in elementary school libraries. It's a middle and up, I think, even if if middle, it's probably in the seventh grade section. But people are upset about it. People are upset about it because the idea of acknowledging that teenagers would ever dare hook up is morally abhorrent to some people. And because people understand how much art can impact and influence thoughts and behavior, especially for teenagers, they're very concerned. And and, I mean, to be fair, my cat's name is Bella. However, unlike the NSFW fan fiction that I was writing as a sophomore in high school, Looking for Alaska is put under scrutiny because it is successful, because it is unique, because it is public, because John Green is occupying a distinct social role and therefore is being given distinct social treatment. John Green has what Berliant calls a particular ability to influence, which is unique to artists that discloses a task and powers that are exclusively theirs and that lead to moral demands that apply solely to them. So as a result, it's almost the opposite of the kind of moral exemptions that we were talking about with, you know, soldiers and doctors. They're not relinquishing and giving up their social position. They're doubling down and affirming it even more. Ariana Grande gets way more flack for that song than I ever did or ever will get for encouraging arson. You know what I mean? Like, which I did not do. That's a joke. But artists affirm this sociality and this social responsibility more than the average person, partially because of this perceived autonomy of the artist. And I say perceived because like nobody wanted to publish Lolita. (laughs) And if nobody did, right, if nobody said yes, then maybe people still would be naming their kids Lolita. Maybe we wouldn't have Lana Del Rey. He was at the mercy of whoever was willing to publish it, whoever was willing to patronize his art. And the only people willing to do so were like an erotic publishing house because they thought they could make money off it. And uh, they were right. Had publishers refused to publish Looking for Alaska with that scene in it, John Green could have perhaps cut the scene. I don't know if that was ever on the table. Like, I don't know if he had trouble publishing the novel or not. But, you know, say he did. Say that he did have trouble publishing it because people were demanding that he cut that scene and he refused. That would be because of what Berliant calls a morality of creativity. One that demands honesty of artists more than truth, that condemns them for acquiescing in formulas and other facile solutions, and that denies them respect when they repeat themselves without pursuing the artistic search for new dimensions of awareness. Ariana Grande may very well have known that the song that she was releasing, Yes And, was not going to be great in the eyes of her moral community, but she did it anyway, and she very well may have done that because she felt an obligation to the art. Brilliant notes that artists not not only retain their social responsibility, they also acquire another responsibility, a responsibility to the art itself. So she very well may have felt an obligation to the art to be truthful, to use it well, which meant for her finding a way to work through her feelings and put out something that felt honest to who she was in the moment and to keep it back would have been a failure to the integrity of the art. Nabokov is incredibly proud of Lolita and has said repeatedly in interviews that he could never regret that story, that he understands why it is his most popular English language book, even though that said, Vladimir Nabokov like hates English. (laughs) Anyway, this is another way that artists can kind of cope with the fact that they may make something that has a negative impact in the long run, according to their moral standards, but they don't, they can't tell, right? We can't predict the future. Principle of aesthetic priority seems to be at work 
in which the integrity of the artist takes precedence over the comfort of the community. This is not unlike the moral demands on the scientist for honesty, independence, and clarity of thought, obligations that fuse the scientific and moral dimensions of a person. Oppenheimer! Just because we can does not mean that we should. And this is an appealing outlook for artists because it opens up the possibility of unrestrained freedom for the artists to follow their talents wherever they may lead, which is fine, right? If you're doing literally anything other than trying to make a living off of your art. <laughs> because remember when I said perceived autonomy of the artist? Just because it's not the Catholic church in charge anymore doesn't mean it's not someone or rather something. Ariana Grande was in a position where she is financially able to do whatever the fuck she wants. Like, if her label doesn't want her to release a song, she can probably just do it herself. Assuming that she's not sort of contracted to all hell like JoJo was. But if she wanted to put that song out and, you know, she was like me, like, that's going to take a lot of work and money and people might not be willing to work on it. People might not be willing to play it on the radio. People might not be willing to support it. So if no one agrees to help her release the song or no one agrees to publish Lolita or no one agrees to publish Looking for Alaska, it brings us back to this kind of if a tree falls in the forest doesn't make a sound. If no one ever sees it or reads it, it doesn't have an impact on anyone but you. So whether it's, you know, good or bad content get, getting out or whether it's people don't want to publish it because they are censoring LGBTQ work or they are, you know, not interested in supporting people of color writing or whether they don't want to help support you financially because they think that your work is morally wrong for whatever reason. Up until very recently, Recently, that was just it. Like that was the be all end all. We weren't in a position to self publish novels. We weren't in a position to turn our bedrooms into recording studios to release music. We weren't in a position to create communities on YouTube. And we have to now take into account the technological advancements and how they not only impact the making of art, but now the responsibility of it, because now it does matter. What is morally acceptable to be made is no longer just a decision by the ruling class. Remember when we were talking about Kant and I said that we decide whether something is good by buying it? We, as consumers, we have the ability and the power to actively support and patronize work that we want to see made, work that has ethics that we support, work that has moral functionality, work that has moral values that are in line with our moral values, that push the ideologies that we believe, that we think will make the world a better place. I think about like responsibility of an artist, my responsibility as an artist is like, if I talk about stories, then I want to make sure I represent the voices that are in it holistically. I mean, let's the last wrap, wrap out, like I'm making my movie identities and I, I was very much wrestling with the story that I wanted to tell and what that would mean for the people who got to be in it. Because mm. I even had a friend reach out to me, like I announced all the cast and a friend of mine who's a wonderful critic of how we depict fatness in our media. Yeah. And she literally said to me like, "You, all of your cast is very thin and good looking. And, and I was like, yes, you're right. And that sucks. But the reason is, is the story without spoiling too much is literally about how systems try to tell us to exist is very like thin, often very white, like people um, and, and what those roles slot in. So like the characters that I wrote didn't really have a place for a person who wasn't like stereotypically attractive because that's yeah. not what the story was. But in the telling of that story, I'm replicating an economy where like those people don't get, I don't get to hire an actor like that. And so I'm not paying. Yeah, like, do you think there was, was there any kind of a pressure or like a, like a guilt of feeling like, oh, I should have, I should have written a story that could include that. Like, why didn't I write it in this way to be able to include that? Was there any pressure? Mm -hmm. And how do you kind of deal with the fact that like you can, we can't tell everyone's story in every single thing all the time? Yeah, even if I we mean, care about everyone's story. I know it is. It is one of those anxieties that yeah, I did feel anxiety. Like, did I fail in this? And ultimately, it's one of those like. Yes, I would have liked to be more inclusive in the work, but ultimately the story that I wanted to tell from my perspective and this story just has that um, as as part of it. And it means that like 
a in other works or as if like if i tell more stuff with this uh world or whatever like i should be able to include those like figure out where those people fit into the story or uh write more stories that include those folks down the line and also even more importantly use my position of the privilege of being able to make these things right now to be able to mm -hmm. try and lift up other folks. So hiring folks as I, you know, hopefully my career goes on. Consumers are voting with your wallets, so to speak, about what you want to see put out into the world. We are now the commissioners. I love this because it puts the power in the hands of the consumer and the individual. If I started making crazy right-wing propaganda content, you would probably, hopefully, stop supporting me. <laughs> and that would be the right move. Art is a commodity. It is a product. And when we don't like the direction that a product is going, when we don't like the moral actions of the company or the effects of the product, what do we as consumers do? we boycott. Which brings me to the last thing that I want to talk about in this section, which is the Wicked movie. I don't know if people are planning on boycotting the Wicked movie, for the record, but let's say that they are. I don't know if people are planning on boycotting the Wicked movie, but let's say that they are. Okay, for, for the sake of the argument, let's say that people have decided to boycott the Wicked movie, not because of the content, or even because of the quality, because truthfully, I think it's gonna be very good and I'm actually kind of excited about it. But let's say that we're not. Let's say that people have decided to boycott the Wicked movie because of the behavior of the cast members. Whether it is a deliberate decision to boycott, like the choice not to watch certain films and movies that have starred people who have done horrific things, or something less intentional where you just kind of lose interest in a project because the actions of the creators leave a bad taste in your mouth. Either way, what's happening there is that the behind the scenes personal life actions of the artist are directly affecting the financial gains and successes of the art as a product, which can slash will influence how financially supported a project is in terms of reaching new audiences, which will financially impact not just the artists and the creators, but can also diminish the ideological impact of those works. I recently made a Patreon video about books that I have read, and I was kindly informed by a patron that one of the books that I talked about was actually under a marketing boycott by influencers because I'm not a book talker, so I just didn't know that. Uh, but it was because of sort of uh, racist action on behalf of the marketing company. So they were like, you can read the books, but we're not like talking about them, expressing them. And it was a marketing boycott because the, you know, general community understood that they didn't want to sort of punish the writer for the behavior of someone at the marketing company. They didn't want to necessarily, you know, kill her sales of her book and kill her livelihood because of something that someone else did. But a statement needed to be made, right? So that was the kind of easy, I think, nice compromise. But it does mean that like, I can't talk about a book that I really loved, couldn't spread that that book's message, right? And there was also a boycott of the Harry Potter video game, even though JK Rowling herself did not have anything to do with that. But we can't talk about Harry Potter without talking about JK Rowling. We can't talk about the Wicked movie without talking about Ariana Grande and SpongeBob boning. The movie Don't Worry Darling was played plagued by perception and prejudgment based solely on the moral actions of the people who made it. The proliferation of movements and styles in the arts has coincided with the dissolution of widely supported social norms and the dominance of a commercial culture and political ideologies in developing advanced societies has placed artists in a milieu in which the range of possibilities for the social appropriation of art has charged an already ambiguous domain with new complexities. So while the moral and ethical questions surrounding artists and their work have always been raised, and we have always been concerned about artists' behavior outside of their art, when they do things like try to sue someone for libel and lose, or, you know, sleep with everybody's wife, the ways in which all of those things sort of, the ways in which all of those things intertwine and lace themselves around the drive to create capital and sell products is an entirely new 
21st century beast. Because it's not just that like our minds and our desire to respect basic human decency has grown, but also because our technology has grown. No one was banging down Lord Byron's door demanding to know exactly what he meant by Oriental. Admittedly, it's probably because he was always fleeing the country to avoid his debts, but you know what I mean. We couldn't do that before. Angry letters at best. Today? Today though? Today we can. Now, all of our front doors are in our pockets. So now in the year of our Lord 2024, when we don't agree with something that a person with a particular ability to influence does, we don't just boycott their work, we cyber bully them. Part six, surveillance and celebrity. Pablo Picasso, remember that guy? <laughs> Remember that guy, that guy who painted that massive oil canvas depicting the horrors of war, the guy who was put under surveillance by the French authorities because they suspected him of being an anarchist after seeing how often his paintings depicted the poor begging for scraps from the bourgeoisie, the artist who avoided fighting in the Spanish Civil War and joined the French Communist Party in 1944 and said things like, no, painting is not made in order to decorate apartments. It is an instrument of offensive and defensive war against the enemy. The guy who was heavily patronized by the lesbian feminist author Gertrude Stein. That guy? Well, that guy was later described by his granddaughter as a man who submitted women to his animal sexuality, tamed them, bewitched them, ingested them, and crushed them into his canvas. After he had spent many nights extracting their essence, once they were bled dry, he would dispose of them. Yeah, Pablo Picasso, like, would not have survived the Me Too movement, just uh, in case you didn't know that, because I certainly didn't. He had several wives, many of whom were significantly younger than him, and there were reports of him, like, locking women in his apartment, ex right, extreme jealousy, a fascination with young, naked women's bodies as subjects frequent exploitation of sex workers, and that one time that he said that women are either doormats or goddesses. Not, not great. Um, but uh, luckily for him, nobody was live streaming that. It was a different world. Not only in the way that like, most people did not take the mistreatment of women nearly as seriously as they should have been, but also because it was just way easier to get away with shit. Like, it's it was way easier to keep a secret before we had the internet. Okay, there were no there were not ring cameras in the studio. He wasn't liking inappropriate tweets and reposting manosphere TikToks. Uh, the women that he hurt aren't taking to TikTok to break down all of his shitty behavior in a fifty part epic storytelling masterpiece. The culture of celebrity and surveillance was so different. Moral questions have always been raised about artists' character. When Picasso joined the Communist Party in France, it was a big D deal, okay? And he gets asked about it all the time for like the rest of his life. If you wanted an answer from Pablo Picasso, you had to be a journalist or wait for a journalist to go and interview him and ask him and then wait for them to write the piece and then publish the piece and then hopefully you see the newspaper that it's published in or somebody saves it and gives it to you. Like mass distribution was huge, but it has nothing on the internet. The hyper connectivity that aroused with not just how connected we can be on the old school internet with like emails and things, but specifically with social media is insane. Like the, the effects and the implications of that hyperconnectivity are absolutely fucking bonkers. And it cannot be understated how much of a Copernican turn this is on the way that we interact with each other in every way, in like across the board, every single thing, but particularly for art, because it's not just the artist's published work that is up for scrutiny by the moral community. It's what you tweet, it's what you post, what you share, and thanks to surveillance culture, it's how you act in public, who you date, what you wear, what you order. Everything you do is on the table for ethical judgment. 
our daily behavior, especially if you are someone with an online presence, is no longer completely distinguishable from the art that you make. To be anonymous and be defined by your art alone is not really possible or effective in the way that it once was. Unless you're Banksy, where the whole gimmick is that people don't know who you are, even though like people definitely do know who you are, like somebody is signing your checks. That's kind of it, right? I mean, Sia sort of tried to like wear her big hair, but even that didn't protect her from being blatantly ableist and forcing poor teenage Maddie Ziegler to be in that movie. It's hard to have a successful career in any art without selling yourself in addition to the product in, you know, the 21st century. It's just a fact that if you build an audience based on your personality, your chances of being given artistic opportunities and patronage are higher. Whether that's simply because you've built a small community of patrons who are supporting and crowdfunding your work, or it's like mainstream media giving you opportunities. Remember when every single YouTuber was writing a book? <laughs> Like every one of them got a book deal. Dodie, like look at Dodie's career. I use her as an example because this is not necessarily a bad thing. This is not a bad thing at all. Dodie is phenomenal. She's incredibly good at what she does. And it helped that she was able to build an audience and make her art through her Patreon and through, you know, sponsorships and things like that until someone sort of recognized, oh, you have this audience already. I will just pay you to make more and go from there, right? I remember when she shut down her Patreon because she had outside people willing to, you know, fund and support her music. We talked about building online communities where we patronize each other, right? That's what allowed things like Nebula to grow and to become what they are. And, you know, Philosophy Tube and Jesse Genders, all their short films that are telling stories that are important to the community. It's not a requirement, but it certainly helps. <laughs> Because art is powerful in affecting emotions. And when something makes us feel a certain way, we can make that part of our identity. I talked a lot in the Snape Wives video about how the things that you like become a part of your identity, become part of who you are. So that's why sometimes if someone insults your favorite thing, it feels a bit like a personal attack because it's an attack on your identity. And that's a big deal because we are very lonely. We are all alone in our little heads. It's what Emil Durkheim was talking about. We are, you know, desperately trying to communicate ourselves to the other little consciousnesses in, in bodies. And a lot of the way that we do that is through the things that we like. We do it through music, dance, chanting, ritual movement, and cathartic experience. If something makes you feel a certain way and somebody else watches it, they might know how you feel. They might understand it. There is a woman named Abby who uh, she crochets or knits, I think it's crochet, hats. And she also is like a bit of a public speaker, TED talker, because she uh, is autistic and she talks um, in like her um, speeches sometimes about how The Little Mermaid was really important to her and her identity, how important it was for her to show that movie to people and they could see and understand maybe what she felt like. I really understood Ariel. She wanted to be a human be where the people were. When she finally became human, she couldn't talk. That's how I felt. Just like I wanted to be where the typical kids were, she wanted to be where the people were. That's why I like mermaids so much. I think in memories. Memories play in my head like a movie. If you saw the show This Is Us, which was my favorite, you will see flashbacks from when they were babies to kids to teenagers. This is exactly how my mind works. I have to work extra to be in the present moment. We call it getting out of the bunny hole. Art is a language. It's a, it can educate, it can regulate, it can affect and influence. It's, it's a language, it's a communication, it's a tool. So when you see a movie or hear a song that was made by someone else that calls to you and that connects to you and that feels like something that you can use to show your identity to people, of course you want to know more about the person that made that thing because they clearly feel a lot like you do. And that's a rare thing because we're all super lonely little 
mind creatures. Like recognizes like. And this works out really, really well in the case of somebody like Dodie or Taylor Swift, who when they do start speaking and talking about their personal lives, it does line up with what's being communicated in the art. And we feel like we can trust the integrity of the art. We can trust that the artist is taking the responsibility they have to use the art and use it well seriously. And then we can trust in that communication that we are having with that piece of art. We can trust that it is something that we can reliably use as a communication tool for us as well. And from the artist's perspective, from the other side, that is the responsibility to the truth of the art, which is, you know, in a way, a responsibility to the truth of yourself. A couple of years ago, there was a band on TikTok called the Tramp Stamps that came out and made sort of like mini TikTok headlines with a song about how they didn't want to hook up with another straight white guy. It could have gone much better than it did. Okay, we'll leave it at that. There are issues with the song itself. Not that a song like that can't be made, but there were issues with the specific wording of it. But those issues were picked apart and scrutinized a lot because the real nail in the coffin for the tramp stamps was when people started looking into who these women were and looking into their online presence. And they found basically that it did not necessarily line up as well as you would think. And I'm not interested in diving into like who dates who and what that means or anything like that. But the general consensus was that it felt performative and it felt disingenuous and people sniffed it out. You know, it was a perfect storm and, you know, kind of a vicious cycle. The controversy of the song, I think that they probably could have survived. Like, I don't think that was enough to tank a band on its own, but everything else about the situation was. Artists don't just go on talk shows and do Q&As and Time Magazine interviews and podcasts just to talk about the art. They go to talk about themselves because the work is so tied to the person that made it. I could not come out here and talk about a line like my brain still tries to kill me when I'm sober and not like talk about my brain. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like those things are inextricable, the art and the artist. People love Jennifer Lawrence and Renee Rapp for like being real, right? They're being themselves. But at the same time, like it's not real. <laughs> Like it's not, whether it's an interview on Jimmy Fallon or a house tour or a vlog or behind the scenes, it is it is something that is created with intentionality. That's not to say that it's not honest. That's just to say that it's not reality because only reality is reality. Anything you're watching on a screen is not reality. What you're watching right now is not reality. This is not a pipe. I wrote this, like I scripted this. I mean it. And like people in my regular life don't watch my videos because they they get enough of this. They don't need, they don't need a three hour conversation where they can't talk. Like it's not to say that it's not genuine, but it's not reality. And this is really, really obvious with influencers because their art, their product isn't like a movie funded by somebody else or an album that a label is supporting. It's it's just themselves, right? It's it's just it's just them. It's just them and they're curated hyper reality is not just a part of selling a product it is the product but it is also their life it is their life you know uh, to varying degrees obviously it is a little bit real and if every day of their life is spent curating the hyper reality of their online presence and art then the act of curating that hyper reality is also their reality hang in there it's rotting our brains. It's supposed to make, you should feel like that right now because the, we're rotting our brains with what we're doing. We are inceptioning ourselves into oblivion. It is absolutely insane because now like, I, I don't know if you have noticed this in your life, but I have noticed with astonishing regularity, a, a phenomenon of regular people who post on social media as if they are influencers, even though they are not influencers, even though they are accountants, they have private accounts, and yet they are posting these very specific types of photo sets and engagement announcements and pregnancy announcements and new job announcements and I love this product announcements. And this is not to shame or knock those people. That's not like, I, I, I barely qualify as an influencer, right? But, and I do it. Like I, it's just a phenomenon that I've, I've noticed. 
But for the most part, nobody cares. I don't really give a shit what you post on your social media. It is just wild. It's such an insane thing that curating your online persona it has become an art of its own. We are creating unreality and hyper-reality for ourselves. And this super got exasperated during COVID, I think, because we weren't allowed outside. So like it felt even more real what you were creating online because you weren't going out and talking to anybody else. You only had online communication. The idealized versions of our lives that we curate on social media are a form of art. They are hyper reality. They are aspirational in their falseness. And we have imitated them to the point where reality becomes fiction again, right? Romanticize your life and make yourself the main character. We are in a loop of creating something online and then trying to create that in our real life and then putting it online and then trying to create that in our real life. And we're just, we're, we're, we're drowning. We're drowning. <laughs> I'm very stressed about this. And now normal people, normal people who have a viral moment are thrust into the spotlight or put on blast and getting like insane amounts of attention. So clearly the like concept of celebrity has fractured and artist as an honorific has fractured and dissolved right like because what what is art if it can't be sold and it's it's fractured like this because the internet and social media is not a one-way street if you wanted to know about picasso's thoughts on communism in 1957 you had to wait until a journalist went to his house to ask him and then published the article but now now we can we can take our concerns over the moral behavior of anyone celebrity or not straight to the horse's mouth and we bring receipts receipts Scre timeline screenshots i don't actually watch reality tv receipts proof timeline screenshots in everything when pictures came out from the set of sia's movie people had questions and they took to the internet to ask them and she took to the internet to respond and it crumbled from there. When Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher wrote letters saying that their convicted rapist friend never did anything bad to them, so therefore he shouldn't go to jail for doing awful things to other people, people had questions and they took to the internet to ask those questions and they got an answer and put a pin in that. Um, Amelia Hensley is a deaf actress and creator who recently used her platform to call out a deaf made religious movie made by a church that was sort of openly anti-gay and anti-LGBTQ and not affirming at all. And she got hell for it, which I was very pissed on her behalf. And for the record, she handled it with such grace. Couldn't be me. I, I've been attacked by that side of the internet before and I deleted my entire account. Like... But the point that I'm getting at here is that we can have this direct communication and we exploit that fact. There is a book called So You Think You've Been Shamed by Ron Johnson and uh, John Ronson, John Ronson. And I remember listening to a podcast with him in, you know, 2015 or 16 when it came out. And it's a good book. I've read it. I recommend it. It's interesting. He kind of goes, interviews and talks to people who have been publicly shamed. He talks to the woman who uh, tweeted about Ebola and got on a plane and then got off the plane and everyone hated her. I think there was a girl who had taken a, a photo in that was in front of a military statue that people thought was really offensive and she was harassed for that. And the guy, the the, the author of the book who was sort of impersonated on Twitter by these academics and he put them on blast and they their careers were like severely impacted and that was not a thing that I think he expected so that's sort of what the book is about but in that book he says but with social media we have created a stage for constant artificial high drama every day a new person emerges as a magnificent hero or a sickening villain it's all very sweeping and not the way we actually are as people. What rush was overpowering us at times like this? What were we getting out of it? We are creating a culture where people feel constantly surveilled, where people are afraid to be themselves. And he talks about how the safest way to be on the internet is to be bland and to not have opinions. You hear all the time when people are criticizing something that someone else did online, they say, hey, you put it on the internet. You put it out there. You are subject to scrutiny. And and that's just the world that we live in now. 
And I think a lot of this, to be honest, started on YouTube with the sort of infamous YouTuber apologies. <laughs> Or at least that's where the gas got thrown on the fire. You could be kind of harassed for something you did online and have people calling your work and calling your family and gamer gating you before. But the the YouTuber apologies, I think, had a really severe impact on obliterating those final walls between person with platform, person with influence and normal people. Right. This sort of started from a place of, hey, you, a YouTuber who is, their product was themselves, right? Their product was who they are. It was something that they were making. You opened these lines of communication. You welcomed us into this participation, into this community. You have demanded of us, right? Subscribe, watch, support. And now we demand of you. We demand that you explain yourself. And this has really extended into the mainstream celebrities like we had never seen before, right? Notes app, Instagram reels, apologies, apology videos from the Kutchers. And honestly, like, I'm not particularly concerned with the demand for apologies for immoral behavior. If you want to apologize for something, no matter how long ago it happened, no matter how big or small, do it. You do you. If not, whatever. That's your choice. Face the consequences of it either way. I'm interested in how this, how this back and forth over the internet evolved into what we're doing today because we are no longer just demanding that artists talk about their work and talk about their personal lives. We're no longer demanding that they just apologize for immoral behavior because we're not just demanding answers anymore. Now we're demanding statements. Part seven letters and breaks when you say it. According to Anthony Elliott, celebrity is a central structuring point in self and social identification, performing as it does an increasingly important role in self-framing, self-imaginings, self-revisions, and self-reflections. The mere existence of a celebrity or influencer with a large platform is inextricable from our understanding of ourselves and who we are, which I know surprises no one, <laughs> but still. Celebrities and influencers shape who we are, and who we are is also shaped by the systems in which we live. The problem here is that the systems that often shape and control our lives are not the same systems that shape and control the celebrities' lives. And I mean, sometimes they do. We just spent a whole section talking about how we have destroyed the line between regular person and influencer. So there are a lot of influencers who are also just normal people. Madeleine Pendleton is a great example. She has like 2 million something TikTok followers, but she just like runs a business and lives a normal life and talks about communism and she's great. I am a normal person. <laughs> I have a normal life. So keep that in mind as we go through that there are gonna be exceptions to every rule. But for a lot of those more mainstream celebrities, they have come out of our normal world and into a new one. That I'm not a Tory. It doesn't make them all terrible people. It just means that like financially and lifestyle wise, they are no longer affected by the same systems that we are. They don't have problems with the healthcare system of the country they live in. They can either fly to another one or they can afford private care. During the pandemic, none of them had to work and they have these big, beautiful houses to stay in, right? Musicians were setting up home studios during COVID and I have a stinking suspicion that Taylor Swift's home studio was a bit better than mine. I have a feeling that she wasn't on the floor of her closet with a USB Sure microphone. With the exception of BTS joining the army, the normal rules do not apply to celebrities. The worlds are different. So we end up with this sort of triangle where we have our identity and sense of self being shaped by the celebrities and the influencers. And then we also have the structures and systems in place and the socioeconomic conditions that are shaping us as well. And we would love because we're humans and we like when things make sense, we would love for all of these things to connect in a nice little triangle. That would make everybody really, really happy and is probably the reason why a lot of the TikTokers and influencers skyrocket overnight because they become celebrities so quickly that their life hasn't changed yet and they have 
totally normal lives, right? Like Emma Chamberlain skyrocketed because she was so normal and natural and her lifestyle quickly became something that people couldn't relate to anymore. But I'm not a Tory. Systems justification theory is a motivational ideological theory that postulates that most people are motivated to defend, support, and justify social, economic, and political systems on which they are dependent. Familiar institutions, mechanisms, ideas, and practices, or the status quo are perceived as natural and inevitable and therefore legitimate. Which is why we often see queer celebrities and influencers quickly making statements about trans and queer rights, because the systems on which they are dependent are at risk. Women opposing the overturning of Roe v. Wade. When there are threats to a system that you depend on, you are more likely to defend it. <laughs> If the status quo is not working for you, then you are more likely to want to change it. Anyway, there's a reason that Taylor Swift will not comment on her private jet emissions because that is a system that she is dependent on. To be fair, girly can't fly coach. That doesn't mean she has to fly to Starbucks. She's not dependent on over emitting, but it's a system on which she is dependent and she's gonna defend it. Beyonce does not have a moral obligation under systems justification theory to end capitalism. But like, that doesn't mean that she couldn't end capitalism. Or at least it doesn't mean that she couldn't try and probably have some impact too, right? She has power, she has influence, but why would ending capitalism benefit her? <laughs> or any celebrity who is benefiting from capitalism and the systems that be. So that's like first line of defense, right? We know obviously that you do not have to be part of a specific group or personally affected by a tragedy to know that something is a tragedy or to know that people need help. We know that, we'll get there, bear with me. But first things first, I hate to break it to you, whatever it is that you want a statement about probably just does not affect the celebrity or influencer that you want the statement from. That is the most likely reason that you're not getting it. Okay. Also, going forward, we're going to use celebrity and influencer, person of influence, artists, all kind of interchangeably. We are talking about people with platforms, people with power because those are the people who are getting asked the most. At least those are the people that other people are writing articles and making videos about having been asked the most. But you should know that, yes, in fact, this does trickle down to your grandmother's Facebook account. This does happen to normal, not internet famous people. Have you been on the DIY music scene Twitter for your local city? Where were we? Oh, right. Um, no one likes genocide. Bullshit. I'm against racism. Everybody's against racism. What else? They don't. Okay. No one thinks genocide good except maybe the IDF, which is why they are so concerned about making sure that no one describes the massive ethnic cleansing that they have been carrying out in Palestine for decades leading up to the October 2023 act of armed resistance as a genocide, preferring to use terms like defensive action because they know that no one likes genocide. They don't want anyone describing their genocide as a genocide because no one likes genocide. Genocide is bad. And we know that you do not need to be a part of a group to champion for their right to exist. You know that you don't need to be affected by the hunting of orca whales in order to promote Save the Whales. You don't need to be in the queer community to fight for queer rights. I mean, straight but not narrow. A moment of gay history. True, true solidarity for the queer history books. So, like, what is going on, okay? That's what we're here to find out. That said, uh, this does get messy. You know, we can't all handle it with as much grace as Josh Hutcherson did. It does get complicated when you have people, often white cisgender people, talking about issues over the usually non-white or non-cisgender people who are affected by the issue. That's we often are speaking out of turn, we are centering ourselves in the narrative of someone else's oppression or struggle, and those are very real <laughs> common things that we need to be aware of and be better at and be conscious of. But it shouldn't be complicated to say genocide bad, right? And I hope that I'm not coming across as blasé about all of this or, you know, using it as a prop or example, because that's not my intention. But yeah, it, it is the, 
it is the most recent and most egregious example of this phenomena of, you know, people demanding that influencers and celebrities and artists make statements about something. If I was making this video a year ago, I would probably be talking about the attack on trans rights in the United States, which is still an ongoing problem. But, you know, I'm making it today. And as of like four days ago, Elise Myers was bullied off of TikTok for not talking about Palestine. We all know that that's what this video is about. We all know that that's why this video is titled the the way that it is. We all know that that's, that's the thing. So it would be very counterintuitive of me to make a video called why aren't you talking about it and not talk about it so um please bear that in mind please be mature and kind in the comments please be patient and please be respectful also same as with the ethics section please do not think that comparing someone being asked to make a statement on the overturning of Roe v. Wade and someone being asked to make a statement on what's happening in Gaza are the same. Those are not the same things. The, the They're not the same things, okay? That is not the case. That has never been the case. And that is not the point that I am making. This video is getting so serious. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not nearly as fun as the other ones. So here's the thing. The big ones are Taylor Swift and Beyonce. Those are the big ones that people really want these statements about what's happening in Palestine from. Do I personally think that it is a good idea for you to be publicly commenting on a highly reaction-inducing decades-long international conflict when you are regularly gathering hundreds of thousands of people into confined spaces in every major city in the world on a very strict, very public schedule? No. I don't think that's a good idea at all. I think that's a safety risk for everyone. However, not everyone is on an international tour during a major conflict. I mean, half of these influencers are sitting at home all day. So what is their excuse? What was the excuse for Brittany Broski, who made a statement on her news show weeks before the attack saying, if you have a platform, how dare you not sing about things that matter? It is a responsibility that you have. Then later had a private Instagram story of hers leaked where she's basically being like, in what world am I the person to talk about this? In what world is she? the right person to be talking about this. Not many, not many worlds. Elise Myers, Elise Myers was targeted by an organized social media effort called Operation Watermelon. And I'm trying to tread really carefully here, but it's, it's yeah, it was an organized sort of plan to go and flood the comments of all of her videos demanding that she say something. And, and she just, she, t she deleted all of her videos. When I was looking into the Elise Myers thing, which like I'd already started filming the first half of this video when that happened, I came across this Reddit thread and somebody quite literally said they were like, imagine bullying people into activism. And like, they're kind of right. Like I just, we, we have created this echo chamber where everything is amplified, right? John Ronson writes about how the hyperconnectivity of social media means that we are all just one misstep away from our entire lives being ruined. We are one mistake away as normal, regular people, right? As normal people who might send a tweet, get on a plane and come down and have your life be ruined. But then you have people like Elise Myers who already have influence, who already have more eyes on them than the average person. And they don't even have to make a misstep. Simply not stepping, not living up to specific expectations is enough to trigger an avalanche. That can't be right. And the reality is why aren't they talking about it has a million answers and none of them matter. None of them matter. The question is not just why aren't they talking about it, it's why do we care? Part 8. The Pillars of Awful Racism, capitalism, homophobia, transphobia, abuse, ableism, and the prison and military industrial complexes. These are a few of the pillars of awful. These are the pillars of awful. Some of them. There are many. There are probably pillars of awful that I don't even know about. They are big, horrible things. <laughs> big, horrible things that loom over us all the time. 
constantly and they can be found at the bottom of every rabbit hole and holding up all of the oppressive systems and we can pretty much always assume that one or more of them is going to be at the root of any given problem that we have at any given time. The joke about video essayists always bringing up capitalism is only a joke because it's true. <laughs> and it seems like we all sort of understand that celebrities, influencers, people with influence and platforms could all probably make a decent dent in any of these pillars should they try. And yes, but also I kind of think that that might be a little bit of a logical fallacy. Put down your pitchforks, put down your pitchforks, okay? Just hear me out, hear me out. I want to investigate, okay? Because part of me feels like the universal understanding of the fact that just because something can be done does not mean that it should has gone completely out the window when it comes to people opening their mouths on the internet. I'm not making any blanket statements yet, okay? <laughs> so take a few deep breaths, put on your nuance hats, okay? Look, I'm gonna do it too. I'm, I'm also wearing my nuance hat, okay? With all of the knowledge, that we have gained so far. We are going to take a deep breath, look in the mirror, and ask ourselves without judgment and without malice, why? Why do we assume that celebrities and influencers and people with platforms making big statements and affecting, you know, these pillars of awful is always, without fail, a good thing? Why do we assume that it's good? The first thing I think is that it circles back to identity because everything circles back to how we identify ourselves in relation to the things that we like, people who make them, and the world that we live in. Madeleine Pendleton made a great point in one of their videos where she realized that sometimes people just want to hear their favorite influencer say genocide bad because they want confirmation that what's happening is a genocide and that it's bad. They were raised in support of Israel and Zionism, and hearing someone that they trust, whose opinion and artistic integrity aligns with theirs, say definitively, yes, you are correct, the system is wrong, the ideology that you have been fed is a lie, without any other fanfare, is enough and is helpful. To those people. So keep that in mind that I agree with that and I do not want to discount that desire. It's I think the desire to want to see people who we look up to or who we see in our Instagram feeds or whatever, I think the, the desire to want to see those people talking about really distressing stuff comes from this like, I mean, this deeply human desire for meaning and to be handed meaning, right? Mm -hmm. Like in in days gone by, you might go to your pastor or your com like community leader for that sort of, of, of opinion or feedback about a natural disaster or, you know, whatever the king is doing to the duck. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I think, I think we're looking for meaning and we're looking for someone to give it to us. And I think that can be too much I, that, I think that can be too much responsibility to put on just some person. It's really, really, really hard to untangle having been raised with really harmful ideology, right? It's really, really difficult. And I think that a point in the yes, celebrities should be making statements column is that. But that only covers one certain group of people. And it only really covers the desire, not necessarily the impulse to demand, to comment on, to take it upon yourself to publicly declare that this celebrity or influencer should be making a statement. A common theme in all of these sort of videos, comments, articles about how X celebrity is not talking about X pillar of awful is this idea that they are not using their platform correctly. They have great power and they are not living up to the equally great responsibility that comes with it. And I think that that feeling, that resentment and frustration and anger when seeing someone not taking advantage of the power that they have at their fingertips is a manifestation of that gap in the triangle that disconnect because we think to ourselves if i had that platform this is what i would do with it i could do so much good if i had 30 million tiktok followers 
I would be raising so much money. I would be sharing so much information. I would be changing things. And there's a resentment that grows there because it reminds us very clearly that these people, these people of influence, are simply not who we imagined them to be. It highlights that broken part of the triangle because they are not affected by the same systems. They do not have to be educated on things for whatever reason. The silence of celebrities on issues that are really important to us, whether they are part of our personal identity or just basic humanitarian rights and respect, it highlights that broken part of the triangle. It makes that gap stand out, which is frustrating and also an affront to our identity. So that's one possible reason. But at the same time, um, not everyone is critiquing these celebrities in like a necessarily fan-friendly parasocial relationship kind of way. <laughs> Not everybody who is criticizing Taylor Swift has a bunch of friendship bracelets, okay? Not, not everybody is criticizing people they like. The reason that there is an Operation Watermelon is because they are organizing to go after influencers that people don't necessarily follow. So not everybody who is critiquing these people of influence is necessarily a fan and necessarily identifies with the art in a parasocial way. Like that kind of doesn't matter anymore, right? Because we talked about how influencing and social media curation is an art in itself that we all participate in. And you know, remember when we talked about art as it sort of loses its entrenchment with religion and explicit political action and becomes a commodity, it becomes an indicator of taste. And you know how Kant and even Plato and Aristotle all recognized that art can be used to help us hone our taste and judgment skills. Celebrities are integral to self-reflection. They are just as good at helping us decide what we don't want to be as they are at helping us decide what we do. Hating certain influencers and celebrities is a personality trait. Being able to judge and critique artists' behavior, artists' art, artists' actions and lifestyle choices helps us solidify ourselves and communicate to other humans who we are. But remember, in the ethics section, we had to make a distinction about the art that was made out of real people's lives. We tabled that and we talked about it separately because the rules around that feel like they should instinctively be different. What is social media curation if not an illusion of reality? And so in a way, the demanding of a statement about something that is affecting real people's lives on social media is sort of demanding that that kind of art be made. Admittedly, that one is a bit of a stretch because we know we know that they know that people are asking. We know that they know what's going on because the world is all connected. Right? We are all sitting on this hellscape in the ether and we all know that they could and they are not. And because we also see and understand social media as this curation of false reality, we are treating people's lack of comment on a topic, lack of posting about something as a statement as an artistic choice. And we are judging it and using that judgment to refine our identity. And then we are repackaging it and selling it back to the internet. And then someone else is picking it up. They're identifying with that. They're making their own version of that reality. They're filming it themselves, writing up a comment, and they're putting it out on social media again. And we are getting further and further and further removed from the reality of what is going on. We are in these parasocial relationships with people who we have unfettered access to, people who we can demand things of. And we are all, all of us, we are all both artist and consumer. We are product and producer and nothing is real anymore. It's insane. It's insane, but I get it. I get it now. But while that's all well and good as a theory on the possible subconscious motivation for our actions, none of that is real. <laughs> and none of that is deliberate. You know what is real and deliberate? 
the people who are being affected by these pillars of awful, they are real. They are real people. That is not up for debate. And believe it or not, I simply do not believe that the only reason that anybody wants statements from celebrities and influencers on big issues is that they need to validate their own identity. I'm cynical, but I'm not that cynical. I just don't believe that the only reason we are chasing people like Elise Myers off the internet is because we want to verify our identity or even because we get caught in, you know, a landslide of being a troll on the internet. Like, I don't think that either of those things are enough for me to really feel settled with this. So why else are we doing this? What are the sort of literal outcomes that people are wanting and expecting from a celebrity or influencer statement on a given subject? According to Dina Francesca Haynes in The Celebritization of Human Trafficking, published in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science in 2014, celebrities have two main ways that they can influence. They can spread awareness and shed light on a given subject, and they can influence and sway action. We have seen celebrities sway elections. We have seen them raise money for charities. We have seen them influence when they boycott certain events or wear something to a public event that is symbolic of a resistance movement. And Boy Genius performed in drag for their Tennessee show amidst an onslaught of Tennessee law and representatives working to ban drag story times. That was generally very well received. That seemed like a really great way to show solidarity and support at that time. And, you know, we've also seen Maddie Healy kissing his bandmate on stage in a country where that's literally illegal. So um, not all activism is created equal. Hayes writes that while there are benefits to celebrity activism, like the fact that they tend to be more neutral and thus help non-celebrity activists and organizations gain access to policymakers and donors that they normally would not be able to obtain access to, that time Kim Kardashian uh convinced President Trump to pardon Alice Johnson. That was cool. I We don't talk about that enough. The one time that Taylor Swift ever got involved in politics and told people to register to vote, and so like a zillion people registered to vote. There are, there are benefits. Those benefits, however, do not necessarily outweigh the drawbacks. So this article is specifically in the case of human trafficking. That's the specific example that they're using, but I think that it parallels to a lot of other involvements that, you know, I'll try and talk about when they come up. But for the most part, this is about human trafficking. So buckle up again. <laughs> this really, this video is, this video is a real, a real romp, isn't it? That real Biz Barkley wit just flying off the screen. So celebrity involvement in things like in the case of human trafficking often leads to superficial or uninformed narratives and a lack of accountability for solutions that they propose, as well as policies that have a tendency to have adverse and unintended consequences. For example, Ashton Kutcher. I told you to keep him in your brain even before he started defending a rapist on the internet. He became very involved with the anti-human trafficking movement and established DNA, which is a charity organization where their main tactic was to convince men not to pay for sex. That was the plan. Because to be fair, if you don't know, human trafficking is more often than not not scary men kidnapping you in a grocery store parking lot and flying you to a foreign country to live in a metal cage. It is pervasive throughout the United States and you can read about it here. So their goal basically is to tell men not to pay for sex and they work to create, I, I shit you not, a heart and handcuff jewelry item. Off to a great start. Awareness raised, I guess. But what about the campaign itself? What about the convincing men not to pay for sex? How did that work? Um, well, 
uh, let's just say that uh, limiting the client pool for sex workers whose livelihood depends on that job, not, not helpful, not particularly helpful. But, you know, this wasn't about sex workers. This was about victims of human trafficking. They're clearly different. Look at this study that Ashton Kutcher cited all the time. This very flawed study that was debunked by almost 27 scholars. And if that's not bad enough, when Ashton Kutcher was presented with this fact that his, you know, study that he uses for justification for this campaign is actually very flawed and not helping even the victims of human trafficking that he is supposedly so concerned about, his response to the Village Voice was to accuse them of having a financial interest in trafficking. Okay, so I was fact-checking this particular section, um, and... This is so much worse than than I, I thought it was, you guys. First of all, um, this went down on Twitter. I assumed that that was like something he said in confrontation in the interview. No, basically the way this went down was he's been spouting this this fact, this figure about um, the number of, of children that are being trafficked. And Village Voice is like, that doesn't sound right. So they, they you know, fact check and they just publish an, like an expose article. Real Men Get Their Facts Straight, a play on the real men don't buy girls. That was their slogan. So instead of just letting it go, he tweets, hey, at Village Voice, speaking of data, maybe you can help me. How much dollar sign did your escorts in your classifieds on back page make last year? That's, for, that's foreshadowing if I ever heard it. Right? And he just keeps going. Hey, Village Voice, speaking of data, how many of your girls selling themselves in your classifieds are you doing age verification on? Hey, Village Voice, I'm just getting started. BTW, I only played stupid on TV. Hey, at Village Voice, real men don't buy girls and real news publications don't sell them, he ranted on Twitter. And the village voice responds, having a Twitter meltdown. Hey, Ashton, which part of this story is inaccurate? It says, tell us the hard facts you have collected and we'll fact check for you. Where's your fight now? Did you sleep in or are you just tuckered out from last night's Twitter tirade? And he was like, don't worry, I'm up, been up. So, right, so that's like part one of the wildness. And then um, I tried to fact check that, that jewelry because I thought it was Tiffany's. The article, I think that the article said Tiffany's, but... It was like an independent jeweler that Ashton Kutcher and Demi Moore worked with. And I think that they scrubbed it all from the internet because the only articles about it that I can find are this ID that says Demi Moore shows off the handcuff necklace at the Sundance Film Festival. The celebrity couple is offering other equally loved up couples handcuff jewelry. The couple decided to design the collection to help raise awareness for child sex slavery, cause supported by their Demi and Ashton DNA Foundation. Half of the proceeds from the sales of the necklaces will go to the foundation. So like, take it with a grain of salt because this is idiva.com, but it, it sounds like, A, first off, DNA, it's just their names. <laughs> That's a bombshell. And only half of the proceeds, half of the proceeds from these $710 to $2,100 necklaces went to their foundation. Not even like a specific cause. So absolutely fucking bonkers. And, you know, it's in discussing all of this stuff with Ashton Kutcher, Haynes writes, when a celebrity delivers the messages, the audience increases dramatically, but not necessarily to the benefit of the cause. Freddie Highmore, for example, is a neurotypical actor who plays uh, an autistic doctor to the tune of some controversial reviews. <laughs> Let's just... I am a surgeon! But that aside, you know, his portrayal aside, because I'm not autistic, so I'm not, you know, weighing in on that. He is also infamously involved with Autism Speaks, which is, like, practically a hate organization that focuses on the parents of autistic people rather than the autistics themselves and advocates for harmful therapies like ADA and only removed their goal of curing autism from their mission statement in 2016. So, 
Sia. We talked about Sia earlier and her many misguided attempts to raise awareness and help the neurodivergent community that ended up in a sort of ableist mockery that she dragged Maddie Ziegler and Leslie Autumn Jr. down into. I mean, honestly, we could even cite Dax Shepard here to a degree when he had Jonathan Van Ness on his podcast. Dax Shepard just clearly did not know what he was talking about and attempted to have a dialogue or whatever he thought he was doing, trying to bridge the gap and ended up just spreading misinformation and hurting Jonathan's feelings, which like, come on, man, like, that's like, it's like kicking a puppy. Anyway, you get the point, right? Celebrity involvement can do more harm than good. And that's when they are actively invested in attempting to do good and have other informed adults around them. When they take to the internet, just freewheeling, lone wolf out there playing cowboys with a savior complex and an iPhone, that's when we end up with things like the black square nightmare of 2020 which I hate to remind you of. I really, I really do because let's be honest, let's be honest. We have our nuance hats on. A decent number of you probably posted a black square instinctively and then were kindly informed via DM that what was happening was not in fact beneficial to the Black Lives Matter movement and in fact clogged up the hashtag and was stopping actual activists' voices from being heard. At least that's what happened to me. I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. I'm not. I am very much not proud of it. Um, but a very, very, very nice person named Emily kindly explained to me what was going on. And I deleted it. And then when I saw other people posting it, I kindly explained it to them as well and I educated myself and learned my place in these discussions and at protests and here we are today. As much as it makes my stomach roll to think about that moment now, I am so glad that I only had 134 Instagram followers in spring of 2020. I had 134 chances of people seeing that post within the, I'm going to say 30 minutes, maybe an hour, that it was up, I'm assuming, I don't remember. Contrast that with, you know, hundreds of celebrities and influencers who also participated in this and thus inspired God knows how many of their followers to do the same. Leaving celebrities alone to their devices during world crises, maybe not always the best idea. Because this happened in October as well. This happened in October of 2023 after the act of armed resistance carried out by Hamas, where a lot of celebrities were very quick to post I stand with Israel stories and screen grabs because they had no idea what was going on no idea what was going on and someone tells them there was a terrorist attack and they just assume that that is what you do. You stand with the victims of the attack and half of them had to backtrack as soon as people saw this and were like, hey, open a textbook. I say half of them had to backtrack because the other half were Zionists. My point here is that celebrities and people of influence have a tendency to post first and think later because, well, we all have a tendency to post first and think later. <laughs> they just have bigger consequences, but that doesn't mean the impulse is different. So why? Why are we so quick to participate in internet activism and trend posts? There are a couple of theories for this instinct that we all have. Everyone from user 75302 to Charlie D'Amelio. There are a couple of theories, uh, possible explanations, and one of them is impression management motivation. Impression management is a conscious or subconscious process in which people attempt to influence, manage, or control the impression or perception of a person or themselves. So you're trying to control either how someone is perceiving your friend or how someone is perceiving you. And this impression management motivation instinct is unsurprisingly activated by being in highly socially observable situations like being in a large group, being out in public, being on the internet. Kirk Christofferson and a, 
a whole bunch of other people, write that impression management refers to the tendency for individuals to be motivated by a desire to present themselves in a positive light to others. For example, sociology research shows that in online contexts, people may use token displays rather than explicit statements of views to construct and communicate positive identities to others. And those quotes are pulled from a study published in the Journal of Consumer Research in 2014 on the nature of slacktivism. Slacktivism is a willingness to perform a relatively costless token display of support for a social cause with an accompanying lack of willingness to devote significant effort to enact meaningful change. Look, if you make a Facebook page, we'll like it. <laughs> it's the least we can do. But it's also the most we can do. <laughs> Token displays of support or token support is any form of support that allows others to engage with little to no cost to them. So this covers most of the internet. Posting things, liking, sharing, watching, as well as, you know, in real life, wearing a pin or a red button, putting a bumper sticker on your car, hanging a flag, signing a petition, donating your extra change at the checkout line, giving a couple of dollars to an unhoused person. These are all little to no cost to you. And these are contrasted with what they call meaningful support acts, which are consumer contributions that require a significant effort or behavior change in ways that make tangible contributions to the cause. Things like donating a significant amount of money don't, or volunteering your time and skills. And all of these are on a spectrum, you know, not every token act is completely useless to the cause. Not every meaningful act of support is the best, most perfect thing you can do. But they are two distinct ways of participating in activism. And there's nothing ostensibly wrong with token support acts. Signing petitions can be very effective. You can share very informative educational posts. A pride flag might make someone feel more welcome or safe coming into your business or home. The problem is not in the token activism itself. It is in the effect or lack of effect that it can have on movements and causes. So the question that the researchers were trying to answer was not whether or not token or meaningful support is better. They weren't studying the tangible outcome. What they wanted to know was whether or not participating in slacktivism or token acts of support impacted a person's likelihood to then go on to provide meaningful support. Are you more likely to really help a cause in a meaningful way after participating in token acts of support? And this is a fascinating study. I actually really recommend you read it. It's, it was really complicated. There's a lot of numbers and like, I don't do math. Doing math now. I do math now. But it is really, really interesting and in-depth. They do like five studies. They test their, they do all the science, right? It's all the science. So we can't go through all of it, but it will be in the sources. You can read it yourself. So as far as Cliff is concerned, basically they stopped students on their way into a communal building on a college campus. And for some people, they asked if they would take a poppy, which is a little flower thing, and wear it as a pin to display their support for for the veterans in anticipation of Canada's Remembrance Day. And for other people, they asked if they would take this token, this poppy, and keep it with them for the day. And they would give it to them in a little envelope. So it was, you know, in a sealed envelope. And then there was a control group that they left alone because science. Step two, after the students go into the building, when they get to the end of what they described as a very long haul, they were then confronted with some plants, some student spies, that were asking them if they would donate monetarily to support the veterans right there. And this study confirmed that the students who participated in the private displays of token support were more likely to donate higher amounts of money than the students who participated in the public display or the control group. And subsequent studies found similar results. They note that replication of the studies concluded that providing public as opposed to private token support for a cause leads to a resolution of impression management motives, which in turn leads to a lower likelihood of agreeing to provide meaningful support in response to a subsequent request. Which is interesting because humans are often significantly more likely to agree to a larger request from someone 
after they have already agreed to a smaller one. This has been studied as well. If you know you ask someone to use their phone and then you come back later and ask to see their basement, they're more likely to let you see their basement than if you go up to somebody and the first thing you do is ask them to let you see their basement. Across five studies, we demonstrate the existence of slacktivism, wherein an initial act of token support does not lead to an increased willingness to provide more substantial contributions to the cause. However, they did find that after the public token support action, individuals who were then confronted with the idea of a value alignment as part of being asked to participate further were significantly more likely to continue participating. Indeed, when participants first thought about value alignment, those who made the initial public display of support became just as likely as private supporters to agree to a subsequent, more substantial contribution to the cause. We show that by focusing those who engage in an initial act of public support on the value alignment between self and cause, we can increase helping on a subsequent, more meaningful task. Our results consistently find that public token support promotes slacktivism among all but those highly connected to the cause. If the goal of these programs is to generate new interest in and support for causes via a foot-in-the-door procedure, charitable organizations may be using their precious resources suboptimally. So the point of this study was not to find out if people on the internet were virtue signaling. It was to find out if charitable organizations that are trying to allocate their funds in the most beneficial way to the cause are really doing the right thing by investing funds and resources and people's time and money into things like handing out bracelets and creating pins and encouraging these token acts of support. While it is certainly vital to keep highly connected supporters motivated, charitable organizations must carefully consider if the encouraging the public token support is a successful strategy when trying to attract meaningful support from a new donor. And I can hear you. I can hear you screaming at me now. How can I, how can I possibly, how can I possibly be suggesting that sharing posts on and information on social media is bad actually? Blasphemy. I told you to stay calm. I didn't say that all internet social media activism was bad. I said that I thought there was a little bit of a logical fallacy going on. And I, it seems like the science kind of agrees. I'm not suggesting that liking posts and sharing tweets and making statements on your social media is harmful. I'm just suggesting that maybe it's not as effective as we think. We all just seem to agree that this is the best way to do it, but the evidence doesn't really support that. And it really doesn't support the level of vitriol and moral scrutiny that we are lobbing at each other in the name of this support and effectiveness. It seems like, logically, more people knowing about a thing means more people will do something about the thing. Like that seems like it makes a lot of sense. The science doesn't really support that. It doesn't support the idea that it's completely useless and ineffective either. That was just one study. And as well, it's not a dichotomy. It's not a binary. It's not all or nothing. Social media is a communication tool and communication and educating others is step one. You can't rebel or revolt against something that you don't know is happening. In studying the internet and violent conflict, Anita Argoods is offering guidance for how to study the influence of the internet on violent conflict across the world. It's a 2018 journal article and she notes, studies show how the internet has lowered the costs of collective coordination for protest movements. And she goes on to cite a 2015 study of the Tunisian revolution where they found that new media acted as an important platform for the different protest groups to structure their anti-government campaigns effectively. Posting invitations and successes of the protest movement online attracted further supporters. It also provided an opportunity for digitally active users to maintain constant information supply when the traditional media was being censored by the government. And there's evidence to support just the fact that there is less violent conflict in places where they have more cell phone reception and internet. Communication is good right? And social media can be used effectively. Even within the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement heavily utilized Twitter in the sort of early days. It was immensely important. There were so many studies and articles that I found when researching this just about Black Twitter. So like, good on you, Black Twitter. You're doing the thing. Even if we still want to talk about that study that I was citing, we do have that secondary finding or whatever about how values alignment 
made the people who participated in token support just as likely to participate in meaningful support later. So I now want to turn your attention to YouTube darling and America's sweetheart, John Green, once again. I'm making up for drawing all that attention to the fact that people ban his book. John Green loves tuberculosis. <laughs> John and Hank Green used their internet built community to do amazing work with partners in health. Most recently have been uh, working to make change in regards to tuberculosis, which is the deadliest infectious disease that is curable. In 2022, TB killed 1.3 million people according to the World Health Organization, more than COVID or malaria or HIV. Each week, 25,000 people die of TB, a bacterial infection that primarily attacks the lungs. TB is not easy to cure. The best standard of care requires between four and nine months of antibiotics taken daily, but neither is Hodgkin lymphoma. In fact, my brother's cancer was vastly more expensive and complex to cure than TB is, and yet the cost of TB diagnosis and treatment is central to why the disease remains so deadly. That's from uh, his Washington Post opinion piece that was I posted today. I just, I went, I looked up the stats. I just wanted to look up the numbers to make sure I had them correct. Yeah. Oh, two days ago, March 21st, 2024. So last year, YouTube darling in America's sweetheart, John Green, took on Johnson & Johnson. He took on Johnson & Johnson because they were using legal loopholes to maintain a patent on their life-saving tuberculosis medicine. They did not need to be doing this. This was a choice that they were making. And instead of creating a hashtag end TB campaign, which I mean, he may have done, but he took to the internet and took to the community and explained the injustice. And he says in this podcast, tell your friends about this injustice, tell your family, tell the internet, because the only reason Johnson & Johnson executives think they can get away with this is they think that we aren't paying attention to the part of the world where they sell most of their products, their band-aids, their Tylenol, their Listerine. They said, tell your family and your friends, not share it to everybody you know focus on the injustice. It was an appeal to the values of the community. Like I've been a nerd fighter since like 2009. I have watched this community, you know, scale up and down and be effective at making change. And I've watched them learn how to use this community effectively. And as soon as I read that study where they said it was people appealing to values alignment, I was like, oh my God, I get it. Like they figured it out. They figured that out on their own or maybe they read the study. I don't know. Maybe they did their own science. I don't know. But all of their most effective campaigns have relied on appealing to the fact that nerdfighteria, nerdfighters have a shared collective set of values and we want to act in ways that aligns with those values. And that's collective proverbial we. That's not even just nerd fighters. Everybody wants to act in ways that align with their values. So if you present an option to someone as a way to align with their values, they're going to be more likely to participate. And in the case of the tuberculosis and Johnson & Johnson drug, we didn't just like retweet. Like we weren't just reposting TikToks. Like I emailed, I sent emails. The nerd made a made a big stink. We made a big stink about it for Johnson & Johnson and it worked. Johnson & Johnson issued a statement saying that they promise not to go after anyone who makes a generic version of the drug as long as you're not coming from like the United States. <laughs> they were like, as long as you're poor, fine, <laughs> which is huge. They're able to get people in their community to participate in more meaningful acts of support, like donating their funds and their time and sending emails and actually calling people and representatives. And they do this by always emphasizing the community. They talk directly to the person watching or reading, and they talk about the community of Nerdfighteria's values and the individual's values and the work that you and I and we can do together, what we can accomplish if you are able to donate or able to share and help it get to someone who might. I remember, I don't remember which campaign it was, but I remember them saying they were looking for large monetary donations because I think it was when they were trying to raise like a bazillion dollars, but <laughs> they were looking for large monetary donations and they didn't just say like share this, hopefully someone will donate. They said reach out to people in your network. If you know someone who might know someone who is in a higher tax bracket, reach out to them 
here is what you can tell them, explain the cause to them, explain why it matters. And people fucking did. People fucking did. People do. You do get people to participate in meaningful acts of support when you aren't just appeasing their desire to not be attacked on the internet. People are more likely to participate meaningfully in causes that they are connected and directly affected by. And the best way to make people feel connected and directly involved in causes that are happening halfway across the world is to appeal to their values and their desired sense of self. You need to tell the person exactly how this involves them. Systems justification theory, people want to defend systems that they are directly affected by. Because remember, the people that got the private envelope with the token support, that was token support. It was just private. The problem is not the token support. It's the publicness of it. Because when you participate in something privately, it's just for you. You're doing it for yourself because you want to maintain consistency with your values. So you're already thinking about your values. So when someone presents you an opportunity to further align with those values, if nothing else, you'll want to do it just to maintain consistency. <laughs> but with the more public displays, like sharing and retweeting and hashtagging and taking a poppy and wearing the pin, once that impression management motivation is satisfied, we're still focused outward. And the kicker here is that so much of our identity is wrapped up in our online presence in this curated reality that both exists and also does not exist. That if you see posting as a meaningful act of support, it can certainly feel like continuously posting in support of various causes is self-consistency because we've created this false sense of self reality mirror image reproduction thing which like yeah sometimes posting things can be meaningful it can change someone's mind or behavior putting a flag in a window can make someone feel safe a celebrity making a statement can affirm that someone's previously held ideology is wrong it may even be able to convince someone to rethink their own values you can click a link and donate funds like, I don't want anyone to think that I am telling you that liking and reposting is useless and meaningless and we should all stop doing it. That's ridiculous, obviously. You may be able to convince someone to change their mind about something. You can limit the spread of misinformation. These are small things, but they are things nonetheless. We don't need to stop participating in all forms of internet activism and discussion. I just think that we need to reconceptualize the role of the internet in our desire to make meaningful change in the world. We need to reprioritize the actual change and be willing to do that in favor of protecting the impression that we leave on others, in favor of protecting the online version of ourselves that we have so carefully curated. Instead of seeking consistency for that person who is not real, we need to be seeking consistency for the person in here who is. But we need to understand the relationship between what we do and we say online and the real world implications and realities of the causes that we are championing. What are we really asking for? when we are demanding that celebrities and influencers put their two cents in on international conflicts and causes they are not affected by. What are we really trying to do? And can we do that without cyberbullying people? Part nine. So like, like what can we do? <laughs> calm down. We can calm down for one. That's one thing we can do. And that doesn't mean we stop being angry, and that doesn't mean we stop demanding change, and that doesn't mean we stop participating. I'm speaking specifically now <laughs> to those of us who feel caught between these pillars of awful and our desires to destroy them. Our desire to tear them down 
without getting crushed by them and also exist as an artist making art and existing in the digital age, okay? I'm speaking to those of us who feel pressured to make a certain kind of content because of our values, even if we don't feel necessarily motivated or qualified to be making that kind of content. And I'm speaking to those of you who feel like you are desiring more out of people who make content or make art or are celebrities or who feel kind of caught between any of this. Anybody who feels really stressed by how to exist online. I don't have a solid answer, but I do think that we should stop inflating the internet with a magical power that it doesn't have. It is a tool for communication, just like art, just like words. It can be useless and it can be impactful. It is a place where we can take the time to research and understand perspectives that are not our own, where we can find ways of enacting meaningful change in causes that we care about and help people. And it is also a place where we can watch 20 plus hours of somebody else watching iCarly. That's not shade to, to Quentin reviews. I, I've seen all of those videos, some of them multiple times. I'm not saying it's not art, but that's where we're at. Okay, like that's, that's what this is. Art, art was never free of capitalism. It was never about pure expression. Even when it was about pure expression, it wasn't about pure expression. There is nothing pure and simple about making art because there is nothing pure and simple about living in a world with 8 billion other people and several pillars of art awful, towering over all of us all the time. We are what we are made of. We are what we create. We are what we put out in the world. We are all of those things and also all of the things that we take in from the rest of the world. None of that is going to come to a clean and simple solution when we talked about, you know, the ancient Greek perspectives, I told you that they didn't have a word for art the way that we consider it to be art. The word that they use is mimesis. That's the Greek word for creation, imitation, mimicry, copying. When Phidus was sculpting Zeus, if it's Phidas, I'm gonna lose my fucking mind. He had no idea what Zeus looked like. He had to take all of the knowledge that he had of man and translate that into not only an image in his brain of what he thought his god might look like, but then into a physical, real, tangible representation of that for other people to understand. I think that Plato was probably right in a lot of ways to be concerned about us falling for illusions that we create through mimesis. I just don't think that the art is the illusion that we're falling for, I think it's this. This, this is not a real interaction, but I am a very real person and you are a very real person. And it almost feels like this is real, but this is not a pipe. I think a reason that these videos have gotten so goddamn long, not just mine, everybody's, is because in general, I think everybody is like a little bit terrified that they're gonna be misunderstood and have to face the onslaught of the internet. So we, we're going into excruciating detail to explain ourselves and our thoughts and our feelings and our justifications for those thoughts and feelings. And I think it's driving like some of us a little crazy, some of us being me. Everybody's posts are longer. Tweets, tweets are tweet threads. Everybody is talking more and taking more time to explain themselves because we can, because we can control the version of ourselves that we put on the internet. And because we are able to control that version of us, that hyper real recreation of ourselves, be it in a private Facebook post, an Instagram story, or a YouTube video, or even music and traditional art, because we are able to control that, I think that we forget that we can't actually do that. We can't actually control how we are perceived, no matter how hard we try, because we can never really 
get in someone else's head and say, this is, this is me. Touch my brain self. Like, this is who I am. And I get it. I get it. I hate being a consciousness trapped in a body. It's awful. But the power, the power has always been in the art. Let it be in the art. Yes, Disney owns Star Wars and sells Stormtrooper costumes and toys. But that has not stopped people like Jesse Gender and the Daughters of Ferrix podcast from taking the time to break down all of the political implications and embracing that and using their skills as artists to educate and put their perspective out into the world for other people to see. I, I went into this... <laughs> I went into this trying to wrap my head around the like enormous responsibility that I feel as a person with leftist values who makes content that is accessible to the whole internet. And I was hoping, <laughs> I thought that I would find either the strength and inspiration to double down and just scrap the vampire videos, scrap the boys and their whales videos, and and only talk about the BS. That stands for big shit, by the way. I thought that I would find and like summon the courage to be like, fuck fun, I'm gonna be an activist. Or I thought I would find a way to justify uh, not doing that. <laughs> I just, just not, just never. But as usual, as usual on this channel, I am wrong. I was focused on me and my art and what am I intentionally saying? What am I communicating? How am I being perceived and understood? Instead of just like listening to literally anything anybody else was saying. <laughs> this is a community and like I don't just mean you and me or even just like video essays in general, but like literally all of us are, are in a community. All of us with similar values and interests are in a community. And maybe I just need to trust that if and when and where I fall short, someone else will be there to pick up the slack. That is community. That is communal. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And we can only do that if we are paying attention to each other. If we are paying active, kind, open, empathetic attention to each other. That's the only way we're going to see where the gaps are. And like, maybe it's just me, right? <laughs> Maybe everybody else is already doing this. That's very possible. It's very possible that this is just a me problem. Sorry for using we so much, but it makes me feel less alone. So I'm going to keep doing it. If I'm not talking about something, if your favorite celebrity is not talking about something, somebody else probably is. We're just not listening. The internet is not the end stop. It is not the holy grail. It is just a tool and the art that we make on it is just a conversation. It's a form of communication. I'm not gonna change the world with a video essay. <laughs> what gave art its power over and over and over again in all of the stories that I read for this was never anything intrinsic. It was never something that art just had. There were always exceptions to rules or ways to change things because the thing that makes art powerful is the intention behind it, is the ideology, is the belief, the faith, the socioeconomic structure that produces it. The understanding of that power is that power. And the truth is, the truth is, the real sad truth is that I wasted your time. <laughs> I really did. I wasted a lot of your time because this question of why aren't you talking about it, this problem of the responsibility of the artists. This is not a problem that has an answer. <laughs> what is the responsibility of the artist is like asking, like, what is the responsibility of the lion? Like, to what? To do what? Like, what are you? <laughs> you got to be more specific. There's no answer because it's a bad question. We can't solve for X because this is not an equation and it never was. It's a sentence. With great power comes great responsibility. I told you I wasted your time. I wasted all of your time. So where does that leave me? Where does that leave me? Well, I am going to get used to doing a beautiful mind style ethics calculations whenever I make anything. And I'm going to get used to being wrong. Definitely going to get used to being wrong. I'm going to 
try and give myself and especially everyone else who is making things and getting things wrong and getting things right a little bit more grace. I am going to listen. I'm going to listen more and I'm going to listen better, most importantly. And I'm going to try and stop focusing so much on me and what I think my responsibility should be and focus on what I know my power already is. And I'm going to get the fuck off Twitter. Sorry, X. Comment shout out from last video goes to this username. It says, the most iconic move of this generation is this making long ass videos of the exact flavor of philosophy that the substantially large population of Tumblr gays would like as a way to promote her music. That's not what I was doing, but it's not not what I was doing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'd never thought of my video essays as like three hour ads, but that is what they are. You can find me on Patreon. There will be a bonus video full of just stuff that I just cut and little deep dives into some of these things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my EP comes out on April 24th. Thank you for the people who participated in um, interviews as well. Thank you to all of my interview participants. Okay, bye. Oh my God.